Hi everyone and welcome to Miss Estric Biology. In this video I'm going through every single topic that could come up on OCRA paper one. So you know it's going to be a long one but there's always the option of times two speed or skip to the chapters that you need most help with. So let's get ready and if you do need more support with this then don't forget to check out my OCRA notes or my flashcards both of which are going to help you to remember the key marking points and get you ready for those exams. But for now, let's get into it. So the first thing you need to know is about the four different types of microscopes. Here's a very basic summary, but we will go into each type in a little bit more detail. So for our light or optical microscopes, they have a poor resolution, and that is because of the wavelength of light. And light is what is used to create the image. You can use living samples though, and that means that you can have a color. You can use living samples though, and you can get a color image. Transmission electron microscopes have a much higher magnification and resolution, and in these microscopes, the electrons pass through the specimen to create an image. Scanning electron microscopes, very similar, except the electrons are bouncing off the surface, so you actually create a 3D image. And then lastly, the laser scanning confocal microscopes. These are high resolution and 3D, and it uses laser light to create the image. So we'll go through all of those in a little bit more detail. But first, let's see what we mean by this term resolution and magnification, which was used in that summary. The resolution is the minimum distance between two objects in which you can still view them as separate. And in a light microscope or optical microscope, this is determined by the wavelength of the light. Whereas electron microscopes, it's determined by the wavelength of an electron. Magnification refers to how many times larger the image is compared to the actual object that you are viewing. So with the light microscopes or optical microscopes, there are four types of slide preparation that you need to be familiar with. Dry mount, wet mount, squash slide, and smear slide. The dry mounts are when thin slices or even the whole organism or specimen are viewed. And what you would do is place that specimen on top of your glass slide with just a cover slip placed on top. So this might be used if you're examining a really thin slice of plant tissue, or you might have tried this before with your own hair. Wet mounts are more common, and you would have done this potentially in lower school when you looked at maybe a swab of your cheek cells or onion cells. And this is when the specimens are added to water or maybe a stain before you have the cover slip lowered on top with a mounted needle to prevent air bubbles forming. And if you were going to examine living aquatic organisms, you would have to do that as a wet mount. Now in A-level, you might be more familiar with a squash slide. So these are wet mounts, but then you would push down on the cover slip to ensure that you have a really thin layer of cells so that the light can pass through. So when you did your root tip squash practical, you would have taken a very thin slice from the tip of the root of an onion or garlic, placed the stain on top, squashed it by pressing down and that way you should get light passing through so you could visualize and see the chromosomes. And then lastly are the smear slides. These are created using the edge of another slide to smear your sample across your slide. And this creates a smooth, thin, even coating of the sample. And then you would place the cover slip on top. And this is used for things such as examining blood cells in a blood sample. Next, we move on to this math skill, the eyepiece graticule and calibrating it. So inside a light microscope, in the eyepiece, there is actually a scale that you can insert on a glass disc. And that is what the eyepiece graticule is. And the point of it is that when you look through the microscope, you can use that scale to measure the size of the object you're looking at. But there are different lenses on your microscope which are going to be causing different magnifications. So you might have times 10, times 40, times 100. And at each magnification, the value of one of the divisions on your eyepiece graticule will be different. So you have to know how to calibrate it at every magnification to work out what one division on your eyepiece graticule is worth. So this is how you would do that. You would need to use something called a stage micrometer. And this is a glass slide which essentially has a ruler on it. And you would place that on the stage of your microscope, 
look through your eyepiece and then move your stage micrometer so that it is aligned right next to your eyepiece graticule. So in this image, the circle's representing your field of view when you're looking down the microscope. The bottom scale is the scale on your stage micrometer, and that has been aligned against the eyepiece graticule, which is already within the eyepiece of the microscope. Once you've then got them aligned, step two is to count how many divisions on the eyepiece graticule fit into one of the divisions on the stage micrometer. In this case, we can see two divisions fit into one of the stage micrometers. Now on a stage micrometer, each division is worth 10 micrometers. That's why that value there says 10. It's one division, but that one division is worth 10 micrometers. So we can then use that to work out at this magnification, what is one division worth on the eyepiece graticule. So if we know that one of these divisions is worth 10, and two divisions fit into one of those, is 10 divided by two. So we know that at this magnification, one of these divisions on the eyepiece graticule is worth five micrometers. So you can then measure your specimen to work out what is the actual size of your specimen. Something else that you can do in terms of calculations with the light microscopes, but even with electron microscopes as well, is the magnification calculation. So you need to know that to work out the magnification, it's the size of the image divided by the size of the real object. And you might have to rearrange that formula to work out one of the other components of this equation. And it's never usually that straightforward. Often you have to have changing of units involved as well. So we usually measure the size of an image in millimeters and the size of the real object is usually in micrometers. So to convert your millimeters into micrometers, you would have to multiply by a thousand. So it's normally that additional step as well. So staining is the next thing you need to know about. And some cell components are really difficult to see under the microscope unless you add a stain to make it a much more obvious color so it stands out. And differential staining is a technique which involves many chemical stains being used to stain different parts of the cells, different colors. Again, just to make it visually more obvious what you're looking at. So crystal violet or methylene blue are two stains that are commonly used and they are positively charged stains. And that means they'll be attracted to anything that is negative. So negatively charged components of the cell and they will stain those parts of the cell. You could then also add negrosin and Congo red, which are negatively charged, and therefore they actually can't enter the cells because the side cell would repel it. And that would create a stained background, a different color, and the unstained cells will then stand out. Gram staining is another common use of differential staining. And this is when you use two different stains when you are identifying what type of bacteria you have and we commonly use crystal violet and saffronin. Crystal violet can be added, then you'd actually add iodine to fix the stain, and alcohols are used to wash any stain that hasn't bound, because otherwise it'll all just look really dark. Gram-positive bacteria appear blue or purple, as the stain is retained due to the really thick peptoglycan cell wall that gram-positive bacteria have. So it'll absorb lots of the dye. And here we have an example here. We can see these um, rod-shaped bacteria. They are really dark purple because they've absorbed lots of this crystal violet in that peptoglycan cell wall. So that would then tell you that if you did have an infection, it is a gram-positive bacteria. Gram-negative bacteria cannot absorb crystal violet stain because their peptoglycan wall is thin. So that means they don't retain the stain due to the thinner walls. So instead we have to use a counter stain and this is where we use saffronin. And this will actually turn them red. Now the reason that this differential staining is so important is whether you are infected with a gram negative or gram positive bacteria can determine which antibiotic would be best or most suitable to treat your infection. So that's why they might take a swab and then they would examine to see which type of bacteria you're infected with to then decide which antibiotic to prescribe. You could also be asked to do the scientific skill of scientific drawings. And these are very different to artistic drawings. They have a complete set of rules 
And it includes when you are looking at your specimen under the microscope, you would then try and draw it using, first of all, it has to be a pencil, a really sharp pencil so you can be accurate. You have to include a title of what you've drawn. You have to state the magnification. You Or you could include a scale. You should always annotate the cell components or the cells themselves or the section of tissue that is visible that you've drawn. It shouldn't be sketchy lines. It has to just be solid lines that don't overlap with no gaps and you mustn't do any colouring or shading. So essentially the aim of these diagrams is to show the size, location, proportion. They are not artistic. So that's why we don't have any sketching, shading or colouring. It's all about the facts, the size, shape, position and labelling the structures. And although I've said this for microscopes, when you come on to do dissections, you could be asked to do scientific drawings of what you observe in your dissection as well. So then we move on to the electron microscopes. And a beam of electrons is used here to create the image. And electrons have a very short wavelength. And that is why electron microscopes have a higher resolution. And because they've got a higher resolution, small organelles and internal structures can be visualized. The image is created using an electromagnet. So that magnet is used to focus the beam of electrons. Now you can't actually use living samples with electron microscopes. And that's because the air would absorb the beam of electrons. So your electron microscopes have to be used with a vacuum. So your specimen has to be in a vacuum so that the air doesn't absorb the electrons. The image is also in black and white, so you do have to add a stain to add any colour, or you can do that artificially afterwards. So transmission electron microscopes are one type of electron microscope. And for these ones, your specimen has to be very, very thin. You're using an extremely thin slice through your specimen. They're stained and then placed in a vacuum. An electron gun will then be used to release a beam of electrons. The electromagnet will focus that beam and these transmit or pass through the specimen. Some parts of the specimen will absorb the electrons and that will make them look darker in the image and some parts won't and they look lighter. So you get a 2D image because the electrons are passing through. And these are really useful for being able to see the internal structures of cells. Scanning electron microscopes, in these ones, the specimen doesn't have to be thin because the electrons don't pass through the specimen. Instead, the electrons are beamed onto the surface and the electrons scatter in different ways. So they reflect backwards in different ways, depending on the contours of your specimen. And in that way, you get a 3D image like we can see over here. The laser scanning confocal microscope, this is a type of fluorescent microscope and the image is created using a very high light intensity to illuminate the specimen stained with a fluorescent dye. So this combines the benefits of high resolution optical imaging with depth selectivity, which we can see in this diagram or image. It's slightly out of focus, but you can see that you do have that 3D depth to the image. So this enables scientists to view sections of tiny structures that would be challenging to physically section off, such as in an embryo, to create a 3D image. And the image is created as the microscope scans the specimen point by point using a focused laser beam to create a 2D image or a 3D image in different focal planes. As the light is emitted from the specimen, it creates fluorescence. So the next bit of the spec then is knowing the organelles you find in eukaryotic and prokaryotic cells. You need to know the structure and function. And here are the 13 organelles that you need to know for eukaryotic cells. And eukaryotic cells include animals, plants, and fungi. So here's a cross section of an animal cell showing some of those structures. And here's a cross section of the plant cell. So you can see the location and general shape of these organelles. But we're gonna go through each of them in detail, starting with the nucleus. So the nucleus is composed of a nuclear envelope and that surrounds the outside of the nucleus and it's a double membrane structure. There are holes which we call the nuclear pores and that will allow things like the mRNA to leave the nucleus. The inside has nucleoplasm which is a granular jelly-like material. There are chromosomes inside which are protein bound. So the DNA wraps around these proteins to create 
your chromosomes. And we describe the DNA or the chromosomes as being linear in shape. The nucleolus is much darker if you were to look at it under a microscope. And this is a small sphere inside of the nucleus. And this is where RNA and ribosomes are created. And that links to that function here. It's the site of ribosome synthesis. So that happens in the nucleolus. Other functions of the nucleus are that it's the site of DNA replication and transcription, which is when mRNA is made, and it contains the genetic code for the cell. Flagella are not actually found on all eukaryotic cells. They're found on some, so for example, sperm cells. And it's this whip-like tail structure, and the function is for mobility. It is also sometimes as a sensory organelle for chemical stimuli. Cilia, again, are not on all cells, and these are hair-like projections that come out of the cell itself. And they might be stationary cilia, or they might be mobile. And mobile cilia move to help sweep substances along. And that could be in the trachea, for example. They'll be moving in this wave-like motion to help sweep the mucus up and out of your trachea to prevent lung infection. Stationary cilia are important in sensory organs, such as your nose. Centrioles, these are made up of microtubules, which we can see here in this image, the microtubule. And they occur in pairs to form a centrosome. So that's what we're looking at here. We've got them as a pair forming that centrosome. Now these are involved in the spindle fiber formation, which is essential in organizing the position of chromosomes in mitosis and meiosis. The cytoskeleton is a network of fibers found within the cytoplasm all over a cell. And it consists of microfilaments, microtubules, and some intermediate fibers as well. Now the function of this is it provides mechanical strength to cells, it helps to maintain the shape and stability of a cell, and many organelles are actually bound to that cytoskeleton to hold in a fixed place. Microfilaments are responsible for cell movement, and microtubules are responsible for creating scaffold-like structures. The intermediate fibres help to provide mechanical strength. The endoplasmic reticulum, you have either the rough or the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Both are folded membranes, which we call the cystinae. And we can see that here in this image. We've got the smooth folded membranes. And over this side, they are rough because they have ribosomes attached to the outside. And the RER, the rough endoplasmic reticulum, these are the site of protein synthesis because they have ribosomes on the outside. You will also have some folding of the proteins occurring in the RER. The smooth endoplasmic reticulum is the site of the synthesis of lipids and carbohydrates, and they can also be stored there. And these microscope images are just showing you visually what they look like under the microscope. So you can see these folds of membranes and these tiny dots on the outside, which are the ribosomes for the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Whereas the smooth, you can see these folded membranes, but there are no ribosomes on the outside. Next is the Golgi apparatus and the vesicles, shown in orange in this image. Now these are also folded membranes making cystinae, so they do look similar to the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. But the difference is they're slightly more curved in shape, which we can see here on this electron micrograph image. And you will see vesicles budding off the edges, which again we can see here we've got vesicles coming off the edges. So the function for this is in the Golgi apparatus, you will have the proteins being processed and packaged and modified further. For example, you might have carbohydrates added to the protein and that would make a glycoprotein. You'll have secretory enzymes being made. You'll secrete the carbohydrates. You might transport, modify, and store lipids as well. Lysosomes are created here. Molecules might be labeled with their destination, so adding receptors, for example. And the finished products that are made are released in the vesicles. Those vesicles will then fuse with the cell membrane, which we can see here, and the contents of the vesicle is then released and it can be transported to another cell where it is needed. Lysosomes. So we just said lysosomes can be created by these Golgi apparatus. And lysosomes are vesicles, um, and they're bags or vesicles of digestive enzymes. And they can contain lots of different enzymes. Some functions include the hydrolysis of 
bacteria. So you have lysosomes fusing with phagosomes in phagocytosis that releases the digestive enzyme to hydrolyze and destroy pathogens. They're also involved in completely breaking down dead cells. And then once they have hydrolyzed and digested whatever it is that they're breaking down the lysosome will then fuse with the cell membrane and that will release its contents to the outside of that cell mitochondria are double membrane bound organelles so we have an outer membrane and the inner membrane is shown here in yellow it folds in to create the christi the mitochondria is the site of the fluid center in the middle is called the mitochondrial matrix, which is the site of some of the stages of aerobic respiration. And they actually also contain their own ribosomes and loops of DNA so that they can create the enzymes necessary for respiration inside of the organelle itself. So it's the site of aerobic respiration specifically. Therefore, it's the site of ATP production. And as I've already said, it contains the DNA to code for the enzymes needed for respiration. So the ribosomes it contains are the 70S ribosomes, which are much smaller, which are also the type that are found in prokaryotic cells. So that leads us into ribosomes. Ribosomes are small. They're very, very small. You can see they just like these tiny dots in the microscope images. They're made up of two subunits of protein and RNA. So those are the two molecules it contains. There are ATS ribosomes, which are the larger ribosomes found in the cytoplasm of eukaryotic cells or 70S ribosomes, which are much smaller, found in prokaryotic cells, and also in mitochondria and chloroplasts for eukaryotes. And the function is, it's where protein synthesis occurs. Chloroplasts are found in plant cells, which are eukaryotic organisms. They also have a double membrane. And then inside you have these foldings of even more membrane, which are called the thylakoids. And these foldings stack up to look a bit like coins, and we call those stacks the grana for plural or granum for singular. And you also have this fluid, which is shown in this beigey orange color, which contains lots of enzymes needed for photosynthesis. So this is the site of photosynthesis. Cell walls are found in plants and fungi of eukaryotic organisms, not in animal cells. And in plants, you have microfibrils of the cellulose polymer and fungi, you have chitin instead. So they're made up of two different molecules. Plants have cellulose for structural strength, whereas fungi have chitin. And that is still a polysaccharide, but it also contains nitrogen. The function of the cell wall, though, is to provide structural strength. The plasma membrane is found in all cells, and this would form the cell surface membrane. It's made up of this phospholipid bilayer, and within that bilayer, you have other molecules embedded, such as channel proteins, carrier proteins, proteins on the outside which might act as receptors, glycoproteins which might act as receptors you have cholesterol which affects the fluidity and therefore the permeability of the membrane as well and all of these structures together help to control what can enter and exit the cell or it could be the organelle because you do have these membranes on the outside of some organelles as well so some of those organelles are involved in the production of proteins and you do get long answer questions where it's in this topic, but they want you to link together everything you've learned to say which organelles are involved in the production and secretion of proteins. So let's summarize that. Number one, the polypeptide chains are synthesized on the rough endoplasmic reticulum, or you could say the ribosomes, because those are found on the outside. Those polypeptide chains move to the cystine in the RER and they get packaged and and they get folded and packaged into vesicles to be sent to the Golgi apparatus for further modification. Now they have to move through the cytoskeleton to get to that Golgi apparatus. Once they're inside the Golgi apparatus, the proteins are modified further and packaged into the vesicles, and those secretory vesicles carry the proteins to the cell surface membrane. The vesicle then fuses, and releases the protein by exocytosis. So lastly then we have the prokaryotic cells. And the key differences between prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells are, first of all, the cells are much, much smaller. They don't have any membrane bound organelles. The ribosomes are smaller, we said they're 70S. 
The DNA is not contained within a nucleus, and it's actually circular DNA, not linear, and it's not bound to histone proteins. They do have cell walls, but the cell wall is made up of a molecule called murine. Now, some prokaryotic cells also contain plasmids, a capsule and a flagellum, but they don't all contain those three. So let's have a look at some of those key differences. So we said there's no membrane bound organelles. So that means they don't have their circular DNA in a nucleus. They don't have mitochondria, chloroplasts, the Golgi apparatus and endoplasmic reticulum. They're much more basic organisms. The ribosomes, we said they do still have ribosomes, but they're much smaller. So they are the 70S ribosomes compared to the 80S ribosomes found in eukaryotic cells. They don't have a nucleus, so instead of a nucleus, they have their single circular DNA just free within the cytoplasm, and it's not attached to proteins. And that is what this image here is showing. Now, that is not the same thing as plasmids. Plasmids are additional loops of DNA that some bacteria have. They don't all have them, and they only have a few genes on them, and it's where you'd find the genes for antibiotic resistance. And bacteria either don't have them at all, or they might have them, but they have them in varying numbers. Next, we have the cell wall, and they do have a cell wall, but it's a glycoprotein called murine. The capsule, which again, only some bacteria would have, this is a slimy layer made of protein on the very outside. And the function is to prevent the bacteria from drying out or desiccating. But it also helps to cover the antigens to make it harder for the host's immune system to detect the bacteria. The flagellum, which some bacteria have, and some might have multiple, some might only have one, some won't have any. Just like a flagella in a eukaryotic cell, it rotates and its function is to move the bacterium. So the next part of this chapter is 2.12 biological molecules. Biological molecules all contain carbon but below shows the elements that each molecule contains. So in addition to carbon, carbohydrates have hydrogen and oxygen as do lipids but just in a different proportion. Proteins also have nitrogen and sometimes sulfur and nucleic acids also have nitrogen and a phosphorus. Ions also play a really important role. And here is a long list of the ones that you need to know. So the cations, which are the positive ions, and then the anions, which are the negative ions. The best thing to do to learn this would be to turn all of these into a flashcard. So have cation, calcium ions on one side, and then have the information on the other side to show what the function of that ion is or what important role it plays. So for this bit, I definitely recommend you pause, turn it into flashcards, and then this will be the best way to get your head around all of this content. So then let's take a look at water as a biological molecule. It's a polar molecule due to the uneven distribution of charge. And we can see here we've got delta negative on the oxygen and the delta positive on the hydrogen atoms, which means a slight negative and a slight positive charge. Now, because of that uneven distribution, that enables the formation of hydrogen bonds between the oxygen and a hydrogen atom between two different water molecules. And that's what we're seeing here, a hydrogen bond forming between the hydrogen and the oxygen of different water molecules. And a hydrogen bond is actually pretty weak in terms of bonds, but collectively, they do provide quite a lot of strength. And it's that structure and those hydrogen bonds which form all the different properties of water that we're going to have a look at. So these are the four that you need to know as an important solvent in reactions, a transport medium, a coolant and for providing habitats. So let's take a look at the details for each one, starting with water as a solvent. Because water is a polar molecule, that means that it can also interact with other polar molecules. And the reason for this is the slight positive charge on the hydrogen atoms will attract any negative solutes that have dissolved. And the slight negative charge on the oxygen atoms of water will attract any positive ions in the solutes. So if we think about, for example, sodium chloride, the chloride would be negative, the sodium would be positive, and that is why it dissolves so readily in water. Non-polar or hydrophobic molecules cannot dissolve in water and instead are actually repelled, and that's things like lipids. The cytosol in eukaryotic and prokaryotic cells is mainly water, 
So this ensures many solutes can dissolve within the cell and then be easily transported, which is why this is such an important property. This leads us into the importance of water as a transport medium. Once those solutes have dissolved, they can then be readily transported around plants or animals. And if it's in animals, it'd be within the blood. And if it's in plants, it could be in the xylem or the phloem. Now for this bit of the topic, it would mainly be the xylem that it's referring to because that would be all of those ions that we saw earlier on. But glucose, sucrose, those sugars do also dissolve and they're transported in the phloem. Now it is possible to transport these dissolved solutes in the xylem due to the cohesion that we saw in the water molecules. So we said that hydrogen bonds form between the hydrogen and oxygen atoms in different water molecules. And due to that, the water molecules stick together and they form a continuous column of water. This is an advantage because as water evaporates out of the stomata in the leaves, that leaves a negative space, a negative pressure. And that negative pressure pulls on the continuous column of water and it's easily transported up the stem because it is all stuck or cohesed together. The next one is water as a coolant. And this is due to two different properties of water. First of all, water has a high specific heat capacity. And this means it takes a lot of energy to increase the temperature of water. You do learn that in more detail in chemistry, but that's sufficient for biology. The reason it requires so much energy is because energy is needed to break the hydrogen bonds between the water molecules to increase the temperature. Now that's an advantage because it means internal temperatures of plants and animals remain relatively constant. So even if there is a fluctuation in the air temperature, that should mean that the temperature inside of an organism and in the cells remains relatively constant and that's good because then enzymes are not going to denature or if it gets really cold, they're not going to reduce inactivity too far. So essentially water buffers temperature changes. Now the other property is the fact that water has a large latent heat of vaporization. And this means a lot of energy is required to convert water in its liquid state to a gaseous state, water vapor. And again, that's due to the hydrogen bonds. Energy is required to break the hydrogen bonds between water molecules to turn it into a gas. And that provides a cooling effect when animals sweat, for example, or even when plants transpire. Water also provides a habitat. And we said previously that it acts as a buffer for temperature changes. And that is useful for any aquatic organism as well. Because living in a body of water, if the temperature is buffered, then it should mean that your enzymes aren't going to denature if there are any significant fluctuations in temperature. The other property links back to the cohesion provided by the hydrogen bonds. Those hydrogen bonds not only create a continuous column of water in a xylem, but they also create a surface tension to the top layer of water molecules. And that enables small invertebrates to be able to move and even live on the surface. And that provides them with a habitat away from the predators within the water. Finally, ice is actually less dense than liquid water due to the hydrogen bonds. And as a result, ice floats on top of bodies of water and that can provide a surface habitat for animals such as polar bears. So now we're moving on to the next bit in this topic, which is looking at monomers and polymers. And mono means one, poly means many. So our literal definition is monomers are smaller units which can bind together to create larger molecules or in fact polymers. And a polymer is made up of lots of monomers bonded together. Here are our examples of monomers and polymers that you need to know in this topic. Glucose is a monomer which forms the polymer starch, cellulose and glycogen. Amino acids is the monomer that forms the polymer protein. And nucleotides form the DNA and RNA polymers. So if we have a look at the carbohydrates first, this is showing you an overview of all the carbohydrates that you need to know about. We already said that carbohydrates contain carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, and we can split them into monosaccharides, disaccharides, and polysaccharides. Mono meaning one, saccharide is sugar. So it's just one sugar unit, and that would be your glucose, fructose, and galactose. And glucose is the main one that you learn about. Disaccharides, di meaning two, is two sugars bonded together and you'll be learning about sucrose, maltose, and lactose. Finally, polysaccharides means many sugars. And what you actually have is at least three sugars bonded together. In reality, it's gonna be far more than three sugar units. 
and you'll be learning about starch, cellulose and glycogen. So if we start with glucose, there are actually two isomers of glucose and an isomer is when you have the same chemical formula but structurally it's arranged different. So alpha glucose is the first isomer of glucose we're going to see. There are six carbons, 12 hydrogens and six oxygens and this is how they are arranged. So you have your hexagon. Each point in this hexagon is representing a carbon atom and there'd be another carbon off the top here. But this is the level of detail that you would need to know it in. In terms of the two hydrogens and the hydroxyl groups, those are symmetrical for alpha glucose. If we then have a look at our beta glucose, which is our other isomer, we can see that for beta glucose, which is over on this side, is exactly the same with the exception of this, the hydroxyl and the hydrogen on carbon one, which is this first carbon in the ring, are the other way around, the hydroxyls on top this time. Now, that slight difference has a big impact on the position that bonds can form and therefore the overall shape, structure and function of the polysaccharides. So next we move on to the disaccharides. Di meaning two, and we said it's made up of two sugar units or two monosaccharides. They're joined together by a glycosidic bond, which is formed during a condensation reaction. And a condensation reaction is when a water molecule is removed, a chemical bond is formed to create a larger molecule. And that's what we can see here. Glucose plus glucose forms a larger molecule, the disaccharide maltose, and water is produced. The other two disaccharides you need to know about are lactose and sucrose. All three of the disaccharides are made up of one monomer of glucose, and then it's the second one which is different for all three. Maltose is made up of an extra glucose. Lactose is made up of galactose. Easier to remember because lactose is in the name. And then sucrose, the second monosaccharide it's made up of is fructose. So those are the three word equations for the disaccharides that you need to be aware of. So we said that disaccharides are made in a condensation reaction. That is a reaction we're going to see over and over in the biological molecules topic when making polymers and also when making other molecules. So it's a key definition to learn, definitely one to put on a flashcard. So a condensation reaction is joining two molecules together by removing water and a chemical bond is formed. Hydrolysis reaction is the splitting of part of water molecules through the addition of water and a chemical bond is broken. Let's have a look at a condensation reaction in action. We've got a generic monosaccharide and another generic one over here. We aren't really showing any of the extra details, only where the bond is going to form because that is the part of interest. So we can see here the hydroxyl group, that is where the water is going to be eliminated from. And in removing that water molecule, a bond forms between the carbon, oxygen, and carbon. And that, in this case, is a glycosidic bond. And we name the glycosidic bond by the position it is found. So a 1 to 4 glycosidic bond means it's a bond found between carbon 1 and carbon 4. And the way we number them is always starting from the first carbon after the oxygen in the ring. So this would be carbon 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. And same on this one, one, two, three, four, five, and six. So this is a one, four glycosidic bond. The opposite of that, hydrolyzing, would be breaking that bond through the addition of water. And in doing that, the water is added back in to those hydroxyl groups. And now we go back to having those two monosaccharides. Next, then we move on to our polysaccharide. And this is created by many condensation reactions between many glucose monomers. So just as a basics to start, starch is found in plants and it's a store of glucose. Cellulose is also found in plants, but the function is different. It's for structural strength. Glycogen is found in animals and this one is a store of glucose also. So this summary table goes through the structure and function of all three of those carbohydrates. Again, this would be a great slide to pause and turn into multiple flashcards. Each of these individual boxes could be a flashcard. So let's have a look at starch first. The monomer is alpha glucose. That is the isomer of glucose that this molecule is made up of. And because it's got alpha glucose, it's able to form both one to four and one to six glycosidic bonds. Amylose is one of the polymers in starch and that only has one to four glycosidic bonds. And due to that, 
amylose forms these long straight chains that then coil up to make a helix. So overall it's got a helix shape, whereas amylopectin is made up of 1 to 4 and 1 to 6 glycosidic bonds. And as soon as there's a 1 to 6 glycosidic bond, that results in a branch coming off. So amylopectin is a branched molecule. These two we'd already said on the slide before. So I'm going to skip on now to how the structure links to the function. So we said it's a store of glucose. The fact that the amylose forms a helix means you can compact the molecule to fit a large amount of glucose in a small space. The fact that amylopectin is branched increases the surface area for enzymes to attach onto the end glucose molecules hydrolyze them off, breaking the bond, and that glucose can then be used in respiration. The final one is actually the same for all three. Because it is so large, it's insoluble in water, and that means it can be stored within a cell and not affect osmosis. So it's not going to cause the cell to swell and burst. Cellulose is the next one. This is also found in plants, but the difference here is it is for structural strength. It has a very different structure, and that is all down to the fact that the monomer is beta glucose. Because it's beta glucose, we get one to four glycosidic bonds only, and that results in long straight chains of this beta glucose molecule. Those long straight chains are held in parallel to each other, and many hydrogen bonds form between all of those chains. One hydrogen bond is weak, but because there are so many, it provides this collective strength. And those then form macrofibrils, which combine to form a cellulose fiber. So the function then linking to that structure is the fact that there are so many hydrogen bonds provides that collective strength. And that is why cellulose within the cell wall helps to give structure and prevent the cell from bursting. Lastly, our glycogen is also made of alpha glucose, and it's very similar in structure to amylopectin in starch. It's composed of 1 to 4 and 1 to 6 glycosidic bonds, but it actually has far more 1 to 6 glycosidic bonds than amylopectin. So that means it's even more highly branched. Now, this is important because the fact that there's even more branches means there's an even greater surface area for the rapid hydrolysis back into glucose so the glucose can be used in respiration. And because this is the store of glucose in animals, mainly in muscle and liver cells, if that glucose can be rapidly released, if an animal does need to run to either protect itself or to hunt, then it will have that glucose. Our next biological molecule are the lipids. So these are macromolecules, but they're not polymers. They're non-polar molecules, so they don't have a charge. For that reason, they're insoluble in water, but they do dissolve in organic solvents such as ethanol. And they are hydrophobic, meaning they are repelled by water. Lipids are made up of two molecules, fatty acids and glycerol, and they do not form polymers. The two key lipids that you need to know about are the triglycerides, shown here on the left, and phospholipids, shown on the right. They are very similar in structure. They both have a glycerol molecule here, which is sometimes described as the glycerol backbone, and they then have fatty acids attached to them. A triglyceride has three fatty acids, whereas a phospholipid has two fatty acids, and instead of the third, it has a phosphate group attached to it. So the way that those molecules are made is very similar, but this one is just focusing on the triglycerides. That glycerol molecule binds to the three fatty acid chains through a condensation reaction. So water is eliminated, a bond is formed, and we've made a larger molecule. The bond that forms is an ester bond. So let's have a look at how that occurs. Here's the glycerol molecule, and then we have three fatty acids. Condensation reaction is the removal of water. So we need to have a look at where that water comes from. So it's coming from the hydroxyl group, from the glycerol, and from the fatty acid. When that is removed, we then have a triglyceride, plus three water molecules that were removed, and here is the ester bond. And we have three ester bonds. We have one for each fatty acid that's been bonded on. Fatty acids can be either saturated or unsaturated. A saturated fatty acid is when the hydrocarbon chain has only single bonds between the carbon atoms. An unsaturated fatty acid is when the hydrocarbon chain has at least one 
double bond between the carbon atoms. The properties of triglycerides do link to the structure. So first of all, the function is that they can transfer energy. And this is due to the large ratio of energy storing carbon to hydrogen bonds compared to the number of carbon atoms. So a lot of energy can be transferred if that was to be broken down. Due to that high ratio of hydrogen to oxygen atoms, they can also act as a metabolic water source. And this is because triglycerides can release water if they are oxidized. And this is essential in animals such as camels that live in the desert where there's very little water. As lipids are large, hydrophobic molecules, they are also insoluble in water. And that means they're not going to affect osmosis. They're also relatively low in mass. So a lot can be stored in an animal without increasing the mass as much as muscle would and therefore making them so heavy it could impact their movement. So phospholipids are made up of one glycerol molecule, two fatty acids and a phosphate group. The way they're formed is very similar. It'll just be two condensation reactions instead of three, but we still get ester bonds forming, but it'll be two instead of three that we saw in the triglycerides. Now, because of this phosphate group, it results in very different properties. That phosphate group has a charge, it's a negative charge. And that means that the head, which is what we call this structure at the top, is hydrophilic. And if it's hydrophilic and it's got a charge, it can interact and attract water. The fatty acid tails are nonpolar, so they don't have a charge. And for that reason, they're described as hydrophobic and they repel water, but mix with fats. Now, because of these two different charged regions, they are able to form the phospholipid bilayer. When you add phospholipids to water, because the heads are attracted to water, they will spin to be exposed on the outside. The tails are repelled by water, so they'll spin to be on the inside where they can interact with the other fatty acids, but they're not exposed to the water. And that's how we get the phospholipid bilayer that makes up cell surface membranes, but also some organelles membranes. Cholesterol is our next biological molecule, and it's very different in structure because it's a sterile. Sterols have four carbon rings and a hydroxyl group at one end, and they have both hydrophobic and hydrophilic regions. Now these are embedded in the cell membranes to impact the fluidity. They help reduce the fluidity of membranes at high temperatures, and they increase fluidity at low temperatures. And in that way, they help to control the movement across a cell membrane. Proteins are our next biological molecule, and they are large polymers, and they are described as macromolecules. They're made up of the amino acid monomers, and here is our general structure of an amino acid. We have a central carbon with an amine group, a carboxyl group, a hydrogen, and then the R group is the variable group. And that means it is the part that changes in all 20 different amino acids. Proteins are organized into four different levels. They are first made by the ribosome and creates this polypeptide chain. And then we're gonna look at how that gets folded, processed with different bonds holding the structures together at each of these levels of organization. So the primary structure is the order or the sequence of amino acids in a polypeptide chain. And you do have to emphasize sequence or order to get that mark. The secondary structure is the further folding of the primary structure. And you can either get it folding into an alpha helix or beta pleated sheets. And these shapes are held in place by hydrogen bonds. We can see those just here. The hydrogen bonds form between the oxygen in a carboxyl group and the hydrogen on an amine group. And that is what we can see down here. So it's between different amino acids, between those two atoms, and that holds that beta pleated sheet and alpha helix in place. The next level of organization is the tertiary structure. And this structure is the further folding to form a unique 3D shape held in place by four different types of bonds. There are the hydrophobic and hydrophilic interactions, and these are very weak interactions. The hydrogen bonds, which we already saw, and again, those are quite weak. Ionic bonds are stronger bonds, and those form between the R groups of the different amino acids. And the disulfide bonds, which are only sometimes present because there has to be a sulfur in the R group between two amino acids for this to form. So the ionic and the disulfide bonds form between the R groups of different amino acids. Whereas the dice 
and the disulfide bond, as we said, only sometimes occurs if there is an R group that contains sulfur between two amino acids. The last level of organization is the quaternary structure. And this is when a protein is made up of more than one polypeptide chain, which is shown here by the different colors. So we've got four polypeptide chains collected together to form one protein. And the key example that you learn is hemoglobin, which is made up of four polypeptide chains. Now, hemoglobin also has a prosthetic group attached to each polypeptide chain, and that is the heme group. And a prosthetic group is one that is not made up of amino acids. And for a hemoglobin molecule, the prosthetic group doesn't contain amino acids, but instead it contains the ion. A protein that has a prosthetic group, such as hemoglobin, can be described as a conjugated protein, which simply means a non-protein group has been added to it. You can also group your proteins as either fibrous or globular based on their final 3D shape in the tertiary structure. A fibrous protein has polypeptide chains that form long twisted strands that link together. They're very stable structures, insoluble in water, and all of those three points collectively help to give structural properties. So fibrous proteins provide structural strength. For example, collagen, which is found in your bones, and keratin, which is in your hair. Globular proteins, on the other hand, are normally spherical in shape. They're relatively unstable, they are soluble, and involved in metabolic functions. So, for example, enzymes and antibodies and some hormones. And if you think about enzymes, we do say they're sensitive to certain conditions, such as changes in pH and temperature, and that's what we mean by relatively unstable. Inorganic ions are also within this topic, and there is some overlap with the ions that we looked at in the very, very start of the biological molecules part of this lesson. They occur in solutions in the cytoplasm, sometimes in high concentration, sometimes in very low concentration. Hydrogen ions is one example that you need to know, as well as the hydroxide ions, and that's because these two impact the pH. So if you are looking at enzymes or proteins, if you have too high a hydrogen ion concentration or hydroxide concentration, it could denature an enzyme. The hydrogen ions also have an impact on the Bohr effect on hemoglobin. And we have our hydrogen carbonate, which provides a source of carbon dioxide to plants when dissolved in solution. But in human blood, it lowers the pH. Chloride ions, you learn about how they can have an inhibitory effect of the synapse. Sodium ions and potassium ions are both involved in co-transport, but also in the nervous system. Phosphate ions we've seen within this lesson already in the phospholipids, but also they are involved in DNA and ATP. Ammonium ions, as a result of the decay of amino acids, are involved in decomposition and deamination. Nitrate ions get absorbed through plant root hair cells, and they're essential for the creation of any biological molecule that contains nitrogen for example, proteins and the nucleic acids. Calcium ions, you'll learn about how they have an impact in the synapse and also in muscle contraction. Now, for a range of the biological molecules we've gone through, you need to know the chemical test to see if they are present in a solution or a substance. So first of all, the test for start, one of the polysaccharides, you would add iodine, which is a reddy brown colour. And if starch is present, it turns bluey black. Reducing sugars, you would need to add Benedict's reagent, which is here bright blue in colour, but you have to heat this one up for the reaction to occur. Positive test observation could be a range of colours, going from green to yellow to orange, and then brick red is the darkest. And the more red the final observation is, that indicates there's a higher concentration of reducing sugar. Now, you can also use reagent test strips for this to test for the presence and concentration of reducing sugars. Non-reducing sugars are not able to reduce the copper sulfate in Benedict's, so they have to be hydrolyzed back into the monomers first. So the method for this would be following a negative Benedict's test, meaning it remained blue, you would then have to hydrolyze the molecule. So we'd add acid and boil, and that is your acid hydrolysis. Then we have to cool it down, add an alkali to neutralize the acid, and then we'd add Benedict's and heat and look for those color observations again. Now, although we've got these green, yellows, orange, or brick red colors, it's actually usually only going to be orange or brick red. And the reason for that is 
if you did have sucrose, which is a non-reducing sugar, when you hydrolyze that, you would then have fructose and glucose. So you were doubling the sugar content, meaning you should get a really dark brick red color. The test for proteins is biuret, And the reason I emphasize the spelling here is it is so common for students to misspell this as buret because they take chemistry as well and they think of that piece of equipment from a titration. So it's biuret, and a positive test observation is that blue solution will turn purple. The test for lipids is first of all, you have to dissolve your sample in ethanol. And the way we would dissolve it is you would place your sample in the test tube with ethanol and shake it. After you've done that, you then add distilled water and a positive test observation is a white emulsion forms. You can also use colorimeters as a way to get a quantitative answer instead of qualitative describing the colors. To do this, you would need to set the filter in the colorimeter, and that means you are picking the color. So you have to pick the color that is the opposite on the color spectrum to the color that you have in your test sample. We then calibrate the machine by putting in a sample of distilled water and seeing what absorbance of light there is. Then you replace that with your test sample and it will measure the percentage transmission of light going through your sample. And from this, you can create a calibration curve to work out the unknown concentrations of glucose, for example. You could also use biosensors and in this, a single strand of DNA or protein, which are complementary to the test sample is immobilized. When the sample is added, it will bind to the immobilized DNA or protein. This binding causes a change in transducer and as a result, an electronic current is released. This current is processed to determine the concentration of the sample present. The last option is thin layer chromatography. And this is a practical investigation where you are going to be separating out molecules such as proteins, carbohydrates, vitamins or nucleic acids using chromatography. You can then use this formula here to work out the RF value of the different pigments that have separated. And those pigments would be representing different proteins, different carbohydrates within your sample. We next move on to nucleotides and nucleic acids. So first of all, nucleotides are the monomers from which nucleic acids such as DNA and RNA are formed. And those nucleic acids contain nitrogenous bases, which can be categorized according to their structure, how many rings they have. So a purine has two carbon rings, and that'd be adenine and guanine, as we can see here in the diagram, we've got the first ring and then the second ring. Whereas pyrimidines, those are nitrogenous bases which only contain one ring within their structure. And that'd be cytosine and thymine and DNA, and uracil for RNA. The rest of the nucleotide is made up of pentose sugar, which is ribose for RNA and deoxyribose for DNA. And then finally, both would have a phosphate group. So the thymine or uracil and RNA is complementary to the base adenine, whereas guanine is complementary to the base cytosine. And what that means is you will always have a purine and a pyrimidine opposite each other in the double strand for DNA. And that ensures that the two strands are always equal width apart. Both DNA and RNA nucleotides undergo condensation reactions to go from having the nucleotide to the polymer chain. And it's a phosphodiester bond that forms between the adjacent nucleotides to create that polymer. The polymer of these nucleotides is called a polynucleotide. And that phosphodiester bond is a really strong covalent bond. And that forms between the pentose sugar, which would be deoxyribose in DNA or ribose in RNA, and the phosphate of a different nucleotide. So it formed between the phosphate group and the pentose sugar. Next, we have a look at ATP, and this is very similar in structure to a nucleotide. It contains a pentose sugar, which is always ribose, and it contains a nitrogenous base, which is always adenine. Adenine and ribose together make adenosine, and that's why ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate, because we also have three phosphate groups attached. And those three phosphate ions or groups play a significant role in energy transfer, 
And that's why ATP is essential for metabolism. It's an immediate energy source, providing energy for a whole range of different reactions. Now, ATP is made during respiration, both aerobic and anaerobic, but most of it is made in aerobic respiration. And this is through a condensation reaction using the enzyme ATP synthase. So here we see ADP plus an inorganic phosphate, that's what PI stands for, and that forms ATP plus a water molecule is released because it's a condensation reaction. This is a reversible reaction because ATP can be hydrolyzed using the enzyme ATP hydrolase. And in that case, the enzyme plus the addition of water would split one of the bonds between the phosphate groups. That releases a small amount of energy and therefore we get ADP plus PI. Now, as well as releasing a small amount of energy, the inorganic phosphate group that's been released can then be bonded onto a different compound. And in doing that, it makes the compound it's bonded to more reactive. And we call that phosphorylation. And this is actually an example of phosphorylation. ADP is phosphorylated to form ATP, and that makes ATP more reactive. It has more energy. So going back to DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid codes for the sequence of amino acids in the primary structure of a protein. And it's the primary structure of a protein which determines the final 3D shape and structure of a protein. The polymer, the DNA polymer, forms a double helix made of two antiparallel strands. And those two strands are joined together by hydrogen bonds that form between the complementary bases. So if we have a look at how the DNA structure relates to its function, it's a very stable structure. And that is because of the phosphodiester bonds that form between the adjacent nucleotides, creating what we call the sugar phosphate backbone. And those covalent bonds mean that the whole structure is very stable. The fact that it's double stranded is advantageous when it comes to DNA replication. It means that both of those strands can be used as a template. The fact that there are weak hydrogen bonds between the complementary bases is an advantage for DNA replication as well, because it means that very little energy is required to break those bonds, separate the two strands, and therefore have those two strands acting as a template. It's also a large molecule, and that means it can carry a lot of information. Finally, the fact that there is those complementary base pairing between adenine and thymine and guanine and cytosine means that identical copies can be created when DNA is replicated. Now, DNA can be precipitated out of cells to be examined. And that's one of the methods that you need to be aware of. So you can extract it from plant material using this method. First of all, you'd have to homogenize the cell. So you'd have to break it open with a blender and also a detergent. That will break open the cells and cell membranes will also be broken open by the detergent and that releases the contents of the cells. You would then filter to remove any large debris, add salt to break hydrogen bonds between the DNA and water molecules, add protease to digest the proteins, those histone proteins associated with the DNA, and then add ice cold ethanol to precipitate out the DNA from the solution. And the DNA appears as white strands, like we can see just here in the image. So next we move on to more details on RNA and the polymers of RNA. There are three types, M, T, and R. And if we start with R, the R stands for ribosomal, and that ribosomal RNA is what ribosomes are made up of. It's the main bulk of a ribosome. The ribosomes are also made up of protein, so those are the two components. RRNA and proteins. mRNA is a copy of a gene from DNA. It's created in the nucleus and then it leaves via the nuclear pore to carry a copy of the genetic code of one gene to a ribosome in the cytoplasm. Now it's much shorter than DNA and the reason for that is it's only a copy of one gene. Human DNA, for example, consists of approximately 23,000 genes whereas mRNA is only a copy of one of those genes. So it's going to be much shorter, and therefore it's small enough to come out of the pores in the nuclear envelope. It is short-lived though, and that's because it is leaving the nucleus and entering the cytoplasm. And in the cytoplasm, there are enzymes that can hydrolyze the polymer. 
And that is why we do not want the DNA leaving the nucleus, because if it did, your hard copy of a genetic code is at risk of being hydrolyzed and breaking down. Whereas mRNA, it's short-lived, it just needs to survive long enough to be involved in protein synthesis, and then it's digested by the enzyme, and those nucleotides can be recycled to make another mRNA strand. So the mRNA is a copy of one gene of DNA, but it's a single strand. And every three bases in the sequence codes for one specific amino acid. And these three bases are known as a codon. So a codon is three bases on mRNA that codes for a specific amino acid. tRNA is found in the cytoplasm. It's also a single stranded molecule, but it gets folded to create what we call a clover leaf shape. And it's held in this clover leaf shape by hydrogen bonds. Its job is to transfer or bring specific amino acids to the ribosome. And that's what we have here, an amino acid attached at the top to this binding site. Now it's specific because it is determined by the three bases on the bottom of the tRNA called an anticodon. And these three bases are complementary to a particular codon on the mRNA sequence. Next, we move on to semi-conservative DNA replication. DNA replication is described as semi-conservative because in replication, one entire strand of DNA is conserved and one entire new strand is created from new nucleotides. Copying errors in DNA replication can occur, but they occur randomly, spontaneously, and they result in a change to the DNA base sequence, and that's what a mutation is. That would be an example of a gene mutation. DNA replication occurs in S phase within interphase of the cell cycle. And when describing the DNA double helix, the top and the bottom of each strand have a particular term. We call it the three prime, and this symbol here means prime. So three prime end or the five prime end. And this is determined by which carbon within the deoxyribose sugar of the nucleotide is closest to the top or the bottom. So this side, we're told it is the three prime end. If we zoom in to see that in more detail, what we mean by that is the number carbon that's most exposed. We've got carbon one, carbon two, carbon three, carbon four, and carbon five up here. So the bottom of this chain, carbon three, would be described as being the most exposed. So this would be the three prime end of this chain. Whereas this chain, it's this carbon most exposed at the end, which is our carbon five. So that's what this three prime, five prime refers to. And it's a way to describe the top and the bottom, but take into account the chains are anti-parallel, so they do look slightly different. The enzyme that catalyzes DNA replication is complementary in shape to the three prime end. And that is the relevance of this to semi-conservative DNA replication. That enzyme can only bind at the three prime end of a chain, and then it will move along towards the five prime end. So the key stages in DNA replication are, first of all, the enzyme DNA helicase breaks the hydrogen bonds between the complementary bases of the two DNA polymer chains. And that causes the two chains to separate apart. Both of those strands then act as a template for the DNA replication, and free-floating DNA nucleotides will align opposite their complementary bases on both of those template strands. And within the nucleus, there are free-floating DNA nucleotides. That's where they come from. Hydrogen bonds will then form between the complementary bases of this new strand and the old strand, and then DNA polymerase is the enzyme that will attach to join together adjacent DNA nucleotides. And that means it is forming the phosphodiester bond between the nucleotides to create the new polymer chain. So properties of the genetic code then. There are three special features. It's degenerate, it's universal, and it's non-overlapping. Degenerate means that amino acids are coded for by more than one triplet of bases on DNA. Universal means the same triplet of bases codes for the same amino acid in all organisms. And non-overlapping means each base in a gene is only part of one triplet of bases that codes for one amino acid. So each codon or triplet of bases is read as a discrete unit. Now the reason these different properties are advantageous 
are, first of all, the fact that the genetic code is degenerate means even if a G mutation occurs, changing one of the bases in a triplet, it might mean it still codes for the same amino acid. And therefore, the mutation would have no impact on the final sequence of amino acids in the polypeptide chain and therefore the protein shape and function. Universal is advantageous in genetic engineering, so it means that we are able to remove a human gene, for example, the human gene for insulin, and insert it into the plasmid of the bacterium, and therefore the bacterium will make human insulin. Non-overlapping is also advantageous, linking to the concept of mutations. The fact that each base is only part of one codon means that if there was a mutation in that codon, which meant it now coded for a different amino acid, the mutation will only affect one codon. So in your whole sequence of amino acids that get coded for, only one would be incorrect. And that should reduce the overall impact that the mutation has. And that leads us into this concept of protein synthesis. Proteins are created on the ribosomes of the rough endoplasmic reticulum in two stages. Transcription happens first, and this is when mRNA is created from a copy of one gene on DNA. And then translation is the second stage, and that's where the mRNA has left the nucleus, it attaches to a ribosome, and it is used then to create a polypeptide chain. And that's what we're going to have a look at, these two processes in detail. There are a couple of key terms, though, that you need to be familiar with to fully understand this topic. And the first is introns and exons. Introns are the sequences of bases in a gene that do not code for amino acids, and therefore they don't get coded for to create anything in the polypeptide chain. And in fact, they get removed out of the mRNA after it's been transcribed, and we call that splicing. The introns get spliced out of the mRNA. Exons are sequences of bases in a gene that do code for sequences of amino acids. So those are the coding sections on your mRNA. Then we have start and stop codons. And at the start of every gene, there is a start codon, meaning three bases. And those bases enable the ribosome to attach to the mRNA sequence, and that initiates translation. At the end of every gene, there are three bases that do not code for an amino acid, and that is the stop codon. And when the ribosome reaches those three bases, because it doesn't code for an amino acid, there's no corresponding tRNA molecule, and it causes the ribosome to detach from the mRNA, and therefore it ends translation. So the first stage is transcription. And this is the process in which a complementary mRNA copy of one gene of the DNA is created in the nucleus. And the process is very similar to DNA replication. It starts off the same. DNA helicase breaks the hydrogen bonds between the bases in the two strands of DNA. This causes the DNA helix to unwind, and one strand only acts as a template. And that's what we can see here. The DNA double helix is unwound separated and only one strand is acting as a template for the mRNA. Three mRNA nucleotides within the nucleus will align opposite their complementary bases on that template strand. And then the enzyme RNA polymerase will join together the adjacent RNA nucleotides, forming phosphodiester bonds and creating that new mRNA polymer chain. Once one gene is copied, the mRNA is then modified by having those introns spliced out. It then leaves the nucleus through the nuclear envelope pores and moves to the cytoplasm. And that takes us on to the second stage of protein synthesis, which is translation. So that modified mRNA has left the nucleus through the nuclear pore, and then it attaches to the small subunit of the ribosome at the start codon. The tRNA molecule with the complementary anticodon to the start codon aligns opposite the mRNA and that is held in place by the ribosome. And as we can see here, the ribosome can hold two tRNA molecules at a time. And once the peptide bond is formed, the previous tRNA molecule is detached and the ribosome then moves along. So that's what we can see in that image. 
And forming that peptide bond requires an enzyme and also ATP. So the ribosome continues to move along the tRNA, enabling the next complementary tRNA anticodon to align to the next complementary codon on mRNA. And it continues until the ribosome reaches a stop codon, which causes the ribosome to detach and it ends translation. That polypeptide chain that is now created then enters the Golgi body for folding and modifications. The next part of this topic is enzymes. Enzymes are biological catalysts made up of globular proteins. The active site, which we can see here, is a specific and unique shape due to the folding and bonding in the tertiary structure of a protein. Due to that specific shape active site, enzymes can only attach to substrates that are complementary in shape. So we describe them as being specific. Enzymes catalyze both intracellular and extracellular examples. And intracellular means inside of a cell, extracellular means outside of a cell. So for example, catalase is an intracellular enzyme inside liver cells that breaks down hydrogen peroxide into oxygen and water. Trypsin is an extracellular enzyme in the small intestines that hydrolyzes proteins. And the way that enzymes are catalyzing reactions is they are lowering the activation energy. So all reactions require a certain amount of energy before they occur. And that's what the activation energy is. Taking us into chemistry now. When the enzymes attach to the substrate, they lower that activation that is needed. And that is why the reaction speeds up. So what you need to be able to do is explain how enzymes lower the activation energy. And there's two different hypotheses that went about explaining this. The lock and key is the older model. And this model suggests that the enzyme is like a lock and that the substrate is like a key. And that key is perfectly complementary in shape, so it fits into the lock. So in this analogy, Due to the enzyme's specific tertiary structure, it's completely complementary, so it can slot that substrate into the active site. And the theory here is stating that when we then get these enzyme-substrate complexes, the charged groups within the active site were thought to distort the substrate, and therefore it lowered the amount of energy required to break the bonds in the substrate. Now, since we've started to learn more about the molecular structure of proteins and understanding that they are actually slightly flexible and can move, that hypothesis was updated. So the induced fit hypothesis is the current accepted model. And this one suggests that an enzyme is like a glove and the substrate is like your hand. And by that we mean the glove and the hand are not perfectly complementary in shape until you put your hand inside the glove. So the induced fit model is when the enzyme active site is induced, meaning it's caused to change shape around the substrate. So initially, the substrate and the active site aren't perfectly complementary in shape. But when the substrate collides into it, it induces that active site to mold around the substrate and then it does become perfectly complementary. And when that happens, that enzyme substrate complex occurring puts strains on the bonds in the substrate and therefore it lowers the activation energy required to catalyze that reaction. Now, because enzymes are globular proteins, they are very sensitive to certain conditions. And the following conditions can affect the rate of enzyme-controlled reactions. Temperature, pH, enzyme concentration, and substrate concentration. So if we start with temperature, we can see this particular shape curve. There is an increase in rate with temperature. We reach our optimum, and then there is a sudden decrease in rate at higher temperatures. And the explanation for this is, at lower temperatures, there is less kinetic energy and therefore you are less likely to have a successful collision between the enzyme and the substrate. However, at higher temperatures, there is now so much kinetic energy, it can start to cause lots of additional movement and those high temperatures will start to break the bonds in the tertiary structure. So for example, the hydrogen bonds are going to be breaking, 
that causes 3D shape to unfold and you lose that unique shape active site. Now the Q10 temperature coefficient is a measure of the rate of change of an enzyme controlled reaction as a result of increasing the temperature by 10 degrees C. And the formula to work this out is R2 divided by R1. R1 is the rate of reaction at a temperature of, and your X temperature is whatever your first temperature is. R2 is the rate of reaction at a temperature 10 degrees higher than the one you're comparing it to. Next time we have a look at the pH and too high or too low a pH will interfere with the charges in the amino acids in the active site. That will cause the ionic and the hydrogen bonds to break and therefore that unique 3D shape of the tertiary structure unfolds that changes the shape of the active site and the enzyme denatures. Now as indicated in this graph here Enzymes do have different optimal pHs though, depending on where they work. So for example, any of the proteases digesting proteins that are found in the stomach, they actually have an optimum of around 1 or 2, so pH 1 or 2 because they are working in acidic conditions. Whereas some enzymes actually work better in slightly alkaline conditions, for example trypsin and amylase, uh, because in the small intestines it is slightly alkaline. We then move on to looking at the impact of enzyme and substrate concentration. Now these do not cause the enzymes to denature or cause any change in shape to the enzyme. These have an effect based on the idea of saturation. So if there is a low concentration of substrate, the reaction will be lower as there will be fewer collisions possible between the enzyme and the substrate because there are just fewer molecules there to potentially collide. If you were to increase the substrate concentration, because there are now more molecules present, you're more likely to have a collision, therefore more likely for enzyme substrate complexes to occur, and the rate would increase. However, the rate would eventually plateau, so it would level off at a maximum rate of reaction, and that's because it would reach the point when all the enzyme active sites are in use. Or in other words, the enzymes are saturated and you would now have to add more enzymes as well as more substrate to increase the rate. Moving on to the enzyme concentration effect. At a low enzyme concentration, there will be a low rate of reaction. And that's because if there's fewer enzymes, there's fewer active sites for the substrate to bind to and therefore there'd be fewer enzyme substrate complexes. Increasing the enzyme concentration will increase the rate of reaction because there'll now be more enzyme substrate complexes. But at high enzyme concentrations, unless unlimited substrate is added, the rate of reaction will plateau because there will be insufficient substrate to bind to the large number of enzymes. And you'd end up with lots of empty enzymes not being used. Competitive inhibitors also affect the rate of enzyme-controlled reactions. And there's two types of inhibitors we're going to look at. Competitive are the first type. A competitive inhibitor is the same shape or very similar in shape to the substrate. And that means it's complementary in shape to the active site and it can actually bind to the active site. And that's what we're seeing here. This is the competitive inhibitor. It's binding to the active site. That forms an enzyme inhibitor complex instead of an enzyme substrate complex. It prevents the substrate from binding and therefore it lowers the rate of reaction. Now most competitive inhibitors are reversible and reversible means that they can be removed from the enzyme. Whereas if it was non-reversible, that means it is permanently bound to that enzyme. Now the importance or the relevance of that is if you were to add in a much, much higher concentration of substrate, they would actually start colliding and banging into the inhibitor, knocking the inhibitor out, and therefore the substrate would then be able to bind. So with competitive inhibitors, at high concentration of substrates, they actually don't have um, any impact anymore. And that's what we can see here in this graph. At low substrate concentrations, the competitive inhibitor has lowered the rate of reaction compared to the enzyme reaction with no inhibitor, but at a high concentration, they both plateau at the same maximum rate. The non-competitive inhibitors though, these bind onto the enzyme at a position other than the active site. 
and we call that the allosteric site. Because the inhibitor is bound to the enzyme, it causes the protein to change shape and therefore it changes the shape of the active site and the substrate can no longer bind, regardless of how much is added. And that's why we see there is a lower rate and even plateaus at a lower rate. And it doesn't matter if you continue to add more and more substrate, because the active site is now a different shape, we get fewer enzyme substrate complexes and therefore the rate of reaction is much lower. Now, some inhibitors are what we call end product inhibitors. And this is when the product of the reaction is a reversible inhibitor for the enzymes involved in controlling that reaction. And this is really useful because it enables reactions to be controlled. So essentially, it can turn reactions on and off. So if there is a lot of the product already present from this reaction, that product binds to the enzyme and inhibits it, and it prevents any more of that reaction happening. But when the product starts to run low, the inhibitor is no longer going to be able to inhibit the enzyme, and the reaction starts up again. So that prevents resources from being wasted. So that brings us on to the idea of coenzymes, cofactors, and prosthetic groups. Some enzyme-controlled reactions require an additional non-protein molecule, such as a coenzyme, cofactor, or a prosthetic group to catalyze the reaction. So if we have a look at coenzymes and cofactors first, some reactions require atoms to be carried from one reaction to the next in a multi-step pathway of reactions. And that is actually the case in both respiration and photosynthesis. Some enzymes also require a non-protein molecule to bind to the active site to make it complementary to the substrate. And that is what a cofactor and a coenzyme is. The difference between the two is that coenzymes are organic molecules and cofactors are inorganic molecules, meaning they don't contain carbon. A prosthetic group on an enzyme is a type of cofactor, but they differ in that they are permanently attached to the enzyme by a covalent or a non-covalent force. Precursor activation is when enzymes often occur in an inactive form and they require to be activated by a cofactor so that they can actually work. And this prevents enzymes from causing damage within cells and it ensures they are only used when they are needed. An enzyme is activated by the binding of a cofactor as this causes a change in the shape of the tertiary structure so that the active site now becomes complementary enough in shape to its substrate for it to bind. The precursor protein which is the inactive enzyme, is known as the apoenzyme. When it is activated by the binding of the cofactor, it is known as the holoenzyme. We then move on to biological membranes. And all cells and organelle membranes are composed of a phospholipid bilayer. The cell membrane provides this partially permeable membrane and it's the site of chemical reactions and it also has a role in cell communication. So let's take a look. The model that is used to represent this cell membrane is the fluid mosaic model. And that is because it's a mixture of different molecules from phospholipids, proteins, glycoproteins, glycolipids, cholesterol. That's why it's described as a mosaic. And it's described as fluid because there is some lateral movement in those molecules. The phospholipids, which are shown here in red and yellow, they align as a bilayer due to the hydrophilic heads and the hydrophobic tails that were discussed earlier in this video. Proteins within the cell surface membrane can be extrinsic, which means just on one side, or they could be intrinsic, which means they span across the entire membrane. And in this image, they're called integral instead of, in in instead of intrinsic and peripheral instead of extrinsic. The extrinsic proteins provide mechanical support, or they can make the glycoproteins and glycolipids, and the function of these are in cell recognition as receptors. The intrinsic or the integral proteins are protein carriers and channels which are involved in the transport of molecules across the membrane. The protein channels are tubes that fill with water to enable water-soluble ions that can't diffuse through the phospholipid bilayer 
to diffuse through that water in the channel instead. Whereas carrier proteins will bind with other ions and larger molecules, such as glucose and amino acids, that then change shape and transport that molecule to the other side of the membrane. Lastly, cholesterol, which we can see here in yellow, is present in some membranes and it restricts the lateral movement of molecules in the membrane. And this is really useful because it makes the membrane less fluid at high temperatures. So it helps to prevent any damage to the membrane at high temperatures, preventing water and dissolved ions from leaking out or even leaking into the cell. So these membranes are affected by certain factors. Temperature does have an effect on the structure and the permeability of that phospholipid bilayer. And there's two reasons why. Firstly, at high temperatures, it increases the kinetic energy of those phospholipids, so they're going to have even more movement. And that increase in the fluidity of the membrane means that there's going to be larger gaps periodically between the phospholipids and therefore the permeability increases and it makes it easier for particles to cross the membrane. The second reason is high temperatures could denature the carrier and the channel proteins in the membrane and if that happens and the protein channels and carriers become wider then even more molecules are going to be able to move across that cell membrane that weren't initially able to. So therefore, it becomes more permeable. Solvents can also damage the cell membrane structure. Organic solvents like alcohol, for example, ethanol, dissolve lipids. So it will dissolve the phospholipid bilayer in the membranes. And that damage causes the fluidity of the membrane to increase and become more permeable. Next, we move on to movement across the membranes. And there are six key modes of transport in and out of cells that we're going to have a look at. And it's this six just here. So starting with simple diffusion, this is the net movement of molecules from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration until equilibrium is reached. This process does not require ATP. For molecules to diffuse across the membrane, they must be lipid soluble and small. And that's what we can see here we've got a high concentration of one side of the membrane compared to the other and these lipid soluble molecules then dissolve in that phospholipid bilayer and move down their concentration gradient and this will continue until there is no longer a concentration gradient present. Facilitated diffusion is still a passive process with the movement going down the concentration gradients However, it's for molecules that are either too large to diffuse through the phospholipid bilayer or for molecules that are not soluble in lipids. And so instead, they have to move through the proteins that are embedded within the phospholipid bilayer. So that movement of ions and those polar molecules would be through either protein channels or the protein carriers. Osmosis is the movement of water from an area of a higher water potential to an area of lower water potential or more negative and it happens across a partially permeable membrane and the more negative a water potential that means the more concentrated the solution you have less water but more solutes dissolved in it and there's different types of solutions that occur that have an impact on osmosis an isotonic solution is when the water potential of the solution is the same in the solution and the cell and because there is no water potential gradient, there'd be no net movement of water in or out of a cell. And in an animal cell, we can see here is a red blood cell as an example, that has no impact on the overall size or shape of the cell. A hypotonic solution is when the water potential of the solution is more positive. So it's closer to zero, which basically means there is more water compared to the solute. So as a result, water will move from the solution into the cell, causing it to swell, and it could even eventually cause it to burst if enough water is moved in. In a hypertonic solution, that means the solution is more negative than the water potential in the cell. So as a result, water within the cell will move out by osmosis into the solution, and that causes the cell to shrivel up. But the term we use for that in animal cells is crenation, and we say in plant cells they are plasmalized. In plant cells as well, 
they will not burst as readily because they have that cellulose cell wall. So instead they become really swollen and we describe it as turgid. The next type of transport is active transport. And this is the movement of molecules and ions from an area of lower concentration to an area of higher concentration, which means it's going against the concentration gradient. And for this reason, it requires energy in the form of ATP from respiration. And it involves carrier proteins. It is a selective process as only certain molecules are able to bind to a receptor site on the carrier proteins. When they do that, ATP will bind to the protein on the inside of the membrane. It then gets hydrolyzed into ADP and PI. That causes the carrier protein to change shape and open towards the inside of the membrane. And as a result, the molecule that was attached is released to the other side of the membrane. The phosphate group, or that PI molecule, is then released from the protein and the protein reverts to its original shape and the process can continue to happen as long as ATP is present. The next one is endocytosis, and this is a type of active transport, but it is the bulk transport of molecules into a cell. The cell surface membrane bends inwards around the molecules surrounding it to form a vesicle, and that's what we can start to see happening here. It's bending inwards, and eventually it folds all the way round to form a vesicle. The vesicle pinches off and moves within that cytoplasm. And endocytosis can be classed as either phagocytosis, as we've got on the left, or penocytosis that we have on the right. And when it's a solid particle being taken in, it's called phagocytosis. When it's a liquid being taken in, that is when it's penocytosis. This requires energy from ATP because to change the shape of the membrane around that material does require energy. Exocytosis is another type of bulk transport, but this time it's the movement of molecules out of a cell. So the molecules are contained with a vesicle. Vesicles move towards the cell surface membrane, fuse with the membrane, and the contents of that vesicle is then released to the outside of the cell. This process requires energy because ATP is needed to move the vesicle along the cytoskeleton towards the cell surface membrane. Cell division, cell diversity and cellular organisation. So cell division, first of all in eukaryotic cells, they enter the cell cycle and then divide by mitosis or meiosis. Prokaryotic cells replicate by binary fission and then viruses do not undergo cell division as they are non-living. The cell cycle comprises three key stages. We have interphase, split into G1, S phase, and G2. Then there's the nuclear division, which is either mitosis or meiosis, and then finally, cytokinesis. So let's begin with interphase, and this is the longest stage of the cell cycle. G1, which is the first part of interphase, is when protein synthesis occurs to make proteins involved in synthesizing organelles. The organelles then replicate. The cell is checked that it is the correct size, has the correct nutrients, growth factors, and that there is no damaged DNA. If a cell doesn't pass these checks, then replication does not continue. Then we have S phase, and this is when DNA is replicated. G2 is when the cell continues to grow, energy stores increase, and the newly replicated DNA is checked for any potential copying errors. We then move on to the first option for nuclear division, which is mitosis. Mitosis creates two identical diploid cells, and it's used for growth, tissue repair, and asexual reproduction in plants, animals, and fungi. There are four key stages, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase, or PMAT, as a way to try and remember it. Prophase is when the chromosomes condense and become visible. And in animal cells, the centrioles, which are shown here in yellow, separate and move towards the opposite poles of the cell. The centrioles create spindle fibers, which are released from both poles to create a spindle apparatus. And these will attach to the centromere and the chromatids on the chromosomes in late prophase, early metaphase. Plants have spindle apparatus, but they don't actually have the centrioles. 
Metaphase is the next stage, and this is when those spindle fibers have attached to the centromere, and it causes the chromosomes to align along the equator of the cell. The spindle assembly checkpoint also occurs in this stage, and this is where there is a check to make sure that every chromosome has a spindle fiber attached to its centromere before mitosis carries on to the next stage, which is anaphase. And in anaphase, those spindle fibers start to contract and shorten. And in that way, they move back towards the centrioles at the opposite ends of the poles. And that moving backwards causes the centromere to divide and break. And the chromatids are therefore separated and pulled towards the opposite ends of the poles. This stage requires energy in the form of ATP, which is provided by respiration in the mitochondria. Next, we have telophase or telophase, and the chromosomes are now at each pole of the cell and become longer and thinner again. So therefore, they start to no longer be visible. The spindle fibers will disintegrate, and the nuclear membrane starts to reform around those chromosomes. Cytokinesis is then the final stage of the cell cycle, and this is when the cytoplasm splits, so we get two genetically identical cells. And in animals, the way this happens is, a cleavage furrow forms in the middle of the cell, and the cytoskeleton causes the cell membrane to draw inwards until the cell eventually splits in two. In plant cells, the cell membrane splits into two new cells due to the fusing of vesicles from the Golgi apparatus. The cell wall forms new sections around the membrane to complete the division into two cells. Now you can actually observe mitosis, and this is one of the required practicals. And the stages of mitosis can be viewed using a light microscope in onion or garlic root tips. So you would need to take a thin slice of the root tip from either an onion or a garlic and place it on top of a microscope slide. You then break it down a little bit with a mounted needle. A stain is then added and the purpose of this is to make the chromosomes visible when you put your slide under the microscope. You would then sometimes add acid to help to break down the cellulose connections between the cell walls. Then you would place a cover slip on top and push down. The reason we push down is to squash the tip to achieve a single layer of cells to ensure light can pass through and therefore you can see the individual cells and the chromosomes inside of them. And that's what we can see here, that single layer of cells, light's passing through them. Most of the cells here are in interphase and we can tell that because chromosomes are not visible. But we do have two where the chromosomes are visible. So we could use this to calculate the mitotic index. So this is calculated by counting how many cells are visible in the field of view, meaning the section that you're looking at, and by counting the number of cells that are currently in mitosis. And it's essentially a percentage, this. So the number of cells in mitosis divided by the total number of cells, and then you'd multiply it by 100 to give that answer as a percentage. Now, when they have questions like this, they usually tell you the total number of cells so that you don't end up spending lots of time in an exam just counting lots of cells. And instead, you just have to work out the number of cells in mitosis. And like I said, in this example, we've got two that are in metaphase. So the other type of nuclear division is meiosis. And this is when we have two nuclear divisions, and that results in four genetically different haploid daughter cells. The two rounds of division are referred to meiosis one for the first round and meiosis two for the second. Both stages include prophase, metaphase, anaphase and telophase and cytokinesis at the end. But interphase only happens at the very beginning before meiosis one. Now we said it makes a haploid cell and what we mean by haploid and diploid is a haploid cell, represented by a single letter N, is when you have one copy of each chromosome. A diploid cell, or 2N, is when you have two copies of each chromosome. The genetic differences are introduced in meiosis by two key processes. Independent assortment of homologous chromosomes and crossing over. So let's have a look at crossing over first. During prophase 1, the homologous chromosomes pair to form bivalence. And by bivalent, we mean 
two homologous chromosomes next to each other. And that's what we can see here. We've got our homologous chromosomes represented as one in red, one in green. And they look like this X structure because the DNA is replicated. So we have two sister chromatids attached by a centromere to make a chromosome. And here is the homologous chromosome. Crossing over genetic material can occur. So these non-sister chromatids, meaning a chromatid from the different chromosomes, are crossing over and form what we call a chiasma. And that is where the crossing over happens. Now the tension that that creates can result in breaks occurring. And we then get this exchange in material of those chromatids. And as a result, the alleles that were on this chromatid are now going to be part of this chromosome. So we have this new combination of alleles in the resulting gametes. Independent assortment also increases the genetic diversity. And this happens during metaphase one, where the homologous pairs of chromosomes line up opposite each other on either side of the equator but it is random for each homologous pair which side the maternal and the paternal chromosomes are lying. And that's what we can see here. We've only been shown an example with three homologous pairs, but it shows you all the possible combinations of how they could align at the equator. And for humans, we have 23 homologous pairs. So that means there would be two to the power of 23 possible combinations of how those homologous pairs could align and that works out to over 8 million different combinations and that's what we can see here and you can use that formula 2 to the power of n where n is the number of homologous pairs to work out the number of possible combinations for any different organism and as a result, each gamete receives different combinations of the maternal and paternal chromosomes. We then move on to this idea of organisation, looking at specialised cells as well. Now, multicellular organisms are organised in the following way. Cells are the smallest structure. Then we get tissues, organ, organ systems, and those will work together to create the entire organism. Now, you do need to be aware of a selection of specialised cells. And we've got here the summary of all of the ones that you need to know about. So I recommend that you take a screenshot of this, make your own table, make your own notes, or even turn this into a flashcard. because so you've got the five specialized cells, and for each one, you've got your description here of the structure of the cell and how that links to the function. We then move on to the different tissues. Same thing again, screenshot it in print, have it in your notes or copy it out, or even better, turn it into flashcards. These are the different tissues that you need to be aware of, the structure of each and the function of them. We then move on to stem cells, and these are undifferentiated cells that can self-renew, meaning continually divide and become specialized. Different types of stem cells have different differentiation abilities. And the types that you need to know about are totipotent, pluripotent, multipotent, and unipotent. Totipotent cells can divide and produce any type of body cell. During development, totipotent cells translate only part of their DNA, resulting in cell specialization. Totipotent cells occur only for a limited time in early mammalian embryos. They then develop into pluripotent stem cells. And these are found in embryos and can become almost any type of cell. The only cell that they can't form is the placenta. So for this reason, they are used in research with the prospect of using them to treat human disorders. There are issues with this though, as sometimes this treatment doesn't work or the stem cells can continually divide and that results in tumours. On top of those practical issues, there are ethical issues as well, because there's a debate as to whether it's right to make a therapeutic clone of a patient in order to create an embryo genetically identical to them, to get the stem cells to cure a disease, and then after that, destroying the embryo as well. So the other two types of stem cells are multipotent and unipotent, and these occur in mature mammals and they can only divide into a limited number of types of cells. Multipotent cells, such as the ones found in bone marrow, can differentiate into a limited number of cells, 
And in bone marrow, that is into the different types of blood cell. Unipotent cells can only differentiate into one other type of cell. So the potential uses of stem cells are in both research and medicine. And these include potentially being used to repair damaged tissues or in the treatment of neurological conditions such as Alzheimer's and Parkinson's or it could be research into developmental biology. So here are the three key sections that this topic is split into, and we're going to begin with the exchange surfaces. Now this starts with knowing about the importance of surface area to volume ratio. And exchange surfaces in organisms have many, many similar adaptations, and that is to make sure that substances such as oxygen and carbon dioxide can exchange across the surfaces as efficiently as possible. Small organisms like amoeba, which we have in this diagram here, have a very large surface area compared to their volume. And that means that, first of all, they have a big surface area for the transport of substances, but also it means there is a short distance between the outside and the very middle of the organism. And for that reason, they don't require any special adaptation organs or systems for the transport and instead simple diffusion is sufficient to meet their metabolic needs. Now in contrast large organisms have a smaller surface area compared to their volume and that means there is a larger distance from the very outside of the organism to the very center. Now on top of that larger organisms also have higher metabolic rates meaning that they will require more oxygen for respiration to be able to create ATP. Also, as we said, they've got a smaller surface area to volume ratio and they have got a longer distance from the outside to the middle of the organism. And therefore, they require adaptations to increase the efficiency of exchange across their surface. And this then takes us into this topic where we start off by looking at the gills and fish the alveoli in humans and the tracheal system in insects as adaptations. So the running theme throughout this topic is looking at what provides the large surface area, what helps to maintain a concentration gradient, and what reduces the diffusion pathway. So those will be the adaptations that we'll focus on in the fish, the insects, and in the humans. Now, in general, to increase the surface area, you're looking for structures where you might have projections. So that's what you see in root hair cells, the long protruding part of the cell. Or it could be folded membranes that also increases the surface area. Concentration gradients, that can be maintained through ventilation or a good blood supply, removing the blood which contains high concentrations of substances. And in fish, we're going to have a look at the countercurrent flow mechanism. And then the length of the diffusion pathway can be reduced mainly by having only a single layer of cells and that layer is normally squamous epithelial cells. So those concepts we're going to have a look at in a bit more detail, starting with the mammalian gas exchange system. And the structures that you need to be familiar with are the trachea, bronchian bronchioles and the alveoli. So let's start with the trachea, also known as the windpipe. And the trachea has these C-shaped rings of cartilage that run all the way down. And that is to support the trachea to make sure that it doesn't stick together and close. So it stays permanently open so air can flow through. It's also lined by epithelial cells which are ciliated and contain goblet cells. Ciliated cells are those hair-like structures that help to sweep away any mucus in the trachea. And goblet cells are the cells that make that mucus. So the mucus is really thick and sticky and therefore any pathogens, dust particles will stick to the mucus. And then the cilia will sweep that mucus up the trachea so it can be coughed out. And therefore it doesn't reach the lungs and cause any potential infections. There's also smooth muscle within the walls of the trachea. And that muscle can contract if there are any harmful substances within the air. And that results in the lumen, so this space in the middle here, of the trachea constricting. That reduces the airflow to the lungs. Now, when the smooth muscle relaxes, the lumen dilates. And that stretch and recoil of the lumen is possible because there is also elastic fibres within the tracheal walls. 
The bronchi and the bronchioles are the next structures that you need to be familiar with. The trachea, which we can see just finishing here, in humans it then splits into two tubes, which are the bronchi, singular would be bronchus, and that is to connect to both the right and the left lung. Now those split even further into these smaller tubes, which are the bronchioles. And at the end of the bronchioles, we then have the alveoli. Both the bronchi and bronchioles also have cartilage within their walls, and that is to provide structural support to keep those tubes open. Lastly, then we get to the alveoli. And as I said, these are located at the end of the bronchioles, and this is the site of gas exchange. Oxygen from the alveoli will diffuse into the blood and will be picked up by the red blood cells and carbon dioxide within the blood in the capillary is going to diffuse into the alveoli and then be exhaled. So this then brings us to those three features that you always need to comment on in this topic. What provides the large surface area, the short diffusion distance, and what maintains a concentration gradient? The large surface area is provided by the fact there are a very, very large number of alveoli in both sets of lungs. So one alveoli doesn't have a large surface area. It's the fact that there are millions of those alveoli. The short diffusion distance is because the alveoli walls and actually the capillary walls as well are both only made up of a single layer of cells. And those are squamous epithelial cells, which means they're long and flat. Lastly, the concentration gradient is maintained because each alveolus is surrounded by a capillary network. So as the oxygen diffuses in, that blood is then carried away and constantly replaced by deoxygenated blood. And in the alveoli, because of ventilation, new air is constantly being brought in and the air that would then be rich in carbon dioxide is removed. And ventilation is the mechanism of breathing and it involves the diaphragm muscle and also the antagonistic interactions between the external and the internal intercostal muscles. And these muscles contracting and relaxing is going to change the volume of the thorax and therefore the pressure. So the whole purpose of ventilation is to maintain the concentration gradient in the alveoli for gas exchange. So when you inhale or inspiration, that is because there is an increase in the volume of the thorax. And that means this space here. So you need to know what causes that increase, and we'll come to that shortly. But the fact that there's an increase in volume means that the pressure will decrease. And because inside of the thorax, there is now a comparatively lower pressure compared to the atmosphere, air flows into the lungs. When you exhale or expiration, there's a decrease in volume of the thorax that increases the air pressure and it forces the air out of the lungs. So the cause of those changes is the different muscles contracting and relaxing. So when you inhale, the diaphragm contracts, that causes it to move down and become flatter. The external intercostal muscles will contract and the internal ones relaxed, and that will pull the rib cage up and out. And that is what provides a larger volume. When you exhale, it's the exact opposite. The diaphragm relaxes and that causes it to dome upwards and the external intercostal muscles will now relax and the internal intercostal muscles contract and that pulls the rib cage inwards and down, reducing the volume of the thorax. Now you can actually measure the volume of air inhaled and exhaled using a spirometer and when you do that, you can get a graph that looks something like this. And this is labeled to show you what all of those peaks and troughs are representing. And we're shown here at the beginning, this is just normal respiration. So we're going to have some normal breathing. Then we have forced respiration, which is referring to a really deep inhale and exhale. And then it's going back to normal. And this bit here on this side is telling you what each peak and trough is showing. So your vital capacity, which we can see is going from this point to this point, that is the maximum volume of air an individual can inhale and exhale during a deep breath. Your tidal volume is the air inhaled and exhaled when you are at rest. The residual volume, which is down here at the bottom, 
That is the volume of air that always remains in the lungs so that the lungs don't ever fully empty and collapse inwards. And then to work out your breathing rate, you could use this graph to look at the number of breaths per minute. And we could do that by counting repeating patterns. So how many times we've got peaks over a particular period of time. You can also then work out ventilation rate and that would be your tidal volume times your breathing rate. Oxygen uptake will increase when the ventilation rate increases and that would happen during exercise for example. Next we move on to ventilation and gas exchange in fish which also count as a large organism. Now the challenge that fish face in particular is that there is less oxygen dissolved in water than you have oxygen in the atmosphere. So that's going to lead to issues with maintaining the concentration gradient. But first we're going to have a look at the ventilation in fish. Now fish swim with their mouth open so that water can flow in and over the gills and the gills are the site of gas exchange. The fish will lower their buccal cavity which is within their mouth open their mouth and that will increase the entire volume of the buccal cavity and because there is now a larger volume the pressure decreases and that's what causes water to flow in simultaneously the operculum valve which we can see here as closed is then going to shut and the operculum cavity will therefore expand, which we can see in this section. That will cause an increase in the volume of the operculum cavity and therefore a decrease in pressure. The fish will then raise the floor of their buccal cavity and that then forces the water from the buccal cavity over the gills and then out of the operculum. And at that point when they've raised the buccal cavity and closed their mouth, the pressure is high and it opens the valve and that is when the water can then flow over. So this ventilation ensures there is a constant flow of water over the gills for gas exchange. So the gas exchange in the fish happens over the gills and there are four layers of gills on both sides of their heads. The gills are made up of gill filaments which are these longer parts sticking out and then every gill filament is covered in gill lamellae. And if we zoom in here, we can see the gill lamellae are these semicircle structures on top of the gill filaments. So if we think about those three features that we always have to look for, there is a large surface area because there are so many gill filaments which are all covered in gill lamellae. And the gill lamellae is the exact location of gas exchange. The short diffusion distance is because the gill lamellae and filaments are both very, very thin and the gill lamellae contains this network of capillaries. So it's a short diffusion distance. Maintaining the concentration gradient links to the final and the biggest focus, which is the countercurrent flow mechanism. The countercurrent flow mechanism is to compensate for the fact that water has a lower dissolved oxygen concentration compared to the oxygen concentration in the atmosphere. For fish to be able to maintain the concentration gradient for diffusion across the entire lamellae and therefore maximize diffusion, the countercurrent flow mechanism has to be used. And this is when water flows over the gill lamellae in the opposite direction to the flow of the blood in the capillaries. And that's what we can see here in the diagram. We've got in one direction, we've got the flow and then the opposite direction, the other flow. So we would have here, the top one would be representing the water and the bottom one would be representing the blood. And because they're flowing in opposite directions, an equilibrium in the concentration of oxygen is never reached and that is why diffusion can be maintained along the entire gill lamella. We then move on to gas exchange in insects and terrestrial insects have a tracheal system which is made up of spiracles and trachea and tracheals. The spiracles are valve-like structures that run along the side of the abdomen and they're very much like the stomata in plants. So they can open and close to allow gases to move in and out, but it's also to help prevent water loss. Now those spiracles are attached to trachea and those trachea branch into many, many branching tracheoles and the tracheoles are the site of gas exchange in insects. So how then we have the large surface area, the short diffusion distance and the maintained concentration gradient are due to these facts we've got here. So first of all, the insects can contract and relax the muscles they have in their abdomen 
and this creates this pumping mechanism. So gas gets pumped in and pumped out, a bit like the idea of ventilation. On top of that, the large surface area is maintained by many branching tracheoles, and the fact that there's so many is providing the large surface area. There's a short diffusion distance, again because there are so many branching tracheoles, they will reach a really wide distance across the abdomen of the insect, and the wall of the tracheoles are really thin as well. The concentration gradient is maintained by the cells respiring, so they're going to be using up oxygen and producing carbon dioxide, and that is going to create the gradient, but also when the abdominal muscles contract, it pumps new air in and old air with lots of carbon dioxide in out. And when insects are in flight, we get an added effect because the muscles are going to be contracting and relaxing more rapidly, and that will result in them starting to respire anaerobically and producing lactate. And that lactate will dissolve to form lactic acid, and that will lower the water potential of the cell. Now this causes water and there is always some residual water within the tracheoles, which we call tracheal fluid, to move into the abdominal cells by osmosis. This decreases the volume of liquid inside of the tracheoles, and because now there's less liquid in that same space, it causes a decrease in the pressure. And therefore, air from the outside will move in through the spiracles. 3.12 transport in animals. So we begin this by looking at circulatory systems and each animal has a circulatory system adapted to meet its needs. All circulatory systems will transport gases, nutrients around an organism in a transport liquid, for example the blood, and the liquid is transported around in vessels and there's usually a pump as well to help move that liquid, for example the heart. So we're going to take a look at these four types of circulatory systems starting with the open compared to the closed. So an open circulatory system is what you'd see in invertebrates like insects. And the transport medium, the hemolymph, is usually pumped directly to the body cavity called the hemocele. And there are very, very few transport vessels. The transport medium is pumped at low pressure and it will transport food and nitrogenous waste, but not gases, which are instead transported via the tracheal system, which we just saw. Once exchange has taken place at the cells and tissues, the transport medium returns to the heart through an open-ended vessel. Now, in contrast, the closed circulatory system, this is what all vertebrates would have, and some invertebrates, such as annelid worms. And in this instance, the transport medium is blood, and it always remains inside of blood vessels. Gas and small molecules can leave the blood by diffusion or due to high hydrostatic pressure, and that's what we'll look at in tissue fluid formation. The closed circulatory system transports oxygen and carbon dioxide, and the oxygen is usually transported by pigmented protein, for example, hemoglobin. So next, then looking at the single closed versus double closed circulatory systems. In a single circulatory system, this means the blood passes through the heart once per cycle, and there is only one circuit that the blood takes. For example, fish have single closed circulatory systems. The blood passes through two sets of capillaries. Immediately after being pumped out of the heart, the blood then flows through capillaries in the gills to become oxygenated. The blood will then flow through capillaries, delivering the blood to the body before returning it back to the heart. This system would not enable efficient gas exchange for mammals, but it does work for fish because they have that countercurrent flow mechanism. So the double closed circulatory system, the blood passes through the heart twice per cycle, and there are two separate circuits that the blood would take. Now we see this in birds and most mammals. And one of the circuits is blood vessels carrying blood from the heart to the lungs for gas exchange. And the second circuit is blood vessels carrying the blood from the heart to the rest of the body to deliver oxygen, nutrients and collect the waste. So the blood vessels to be aware of then we have in this table, the arteries, arterioles, capillaries, venules and veins. There's a lot of information on this slide and what I'd recommend is to pause it at this point, either take a screenshot or copy down this table, read through it in your own time so we can see the different structures that are present and you've got some explanation as to why it's important. So this would also be really good to turn into a selection of flashcards. 
So if we have a look at the capillaries first, the capillaries form capillary beds, which is when you have many branched capillaries all connected. And this is typically at exchange surfaces, such as the outside of the alveoli. Capillaries have a really narrow diameter, and that is to slow down the blood flow. And the red blood cells can only just fit through that. And that is so that they end up being squashed against the walls and this maximizes diffusion. Capillaries are also only made up of one single layer in their endothelium. And those are squamous epithelial cells. They're really squashed and flattened. For that property of having only a single layer of cells and the fact that there are small gaps between those cells is what enables tissue fluid to form. Because of those small gaps, liquid and small molecules can be forced out of the capillaries due to high pressure and this then forms tissue fluid and it's called tissue fluid because it's a fluid that ends up surrounding tissues the cells so hydrostatic pressure first of all this is the pressure exerted by a liquid oncotic pressure is the tendency of water to move into the blood by osmosis so tissue fluid formation and reabsorption is all centered around the interaction of hydrostatic and oncotic pressure. So let's look at the formation first of all. So as blood enters the capillaries from the arterioles, which is this end here on the diagram, this is a capillary and there would be an arteriole here where the blood is leading into. The arteriole has a wider diameter compared to the diameter of the capillary and the same volume of blood is therefore being forced into a smaller space and this results in a high hydrostatic pressure. Now, because the hydrostatic pressure is high at this arterial end of the capillary, it forces out water and small molecules, such as glucose, amino acids, fatty acids, ions, and oxygen. Now, that liquid that is forced out, all of these molecules here, is then called tissue fluid, because it is a liquid that is bathing the tissues. And this is actually an advantage because all of those substances that were forced out can then move into the cells if they need it. And any waste products that are made by these cells will move out and can then be picked up and transported away. So the hydrostatic pressure is higher than the oncotic pressure at this arterial end of the capillaries. And that's why the net movement is out of the capillaries and to form the tissue fluid. If we then have a look at the reabsorption of that water, large molecules aren't forced out of the capillaries because they're too big. So things like soluble plasma proteins will remain in the capillaries in the blood, and this will lower the water potential of the blood. So we therefore have a lowered water potential, which means a higher oncotic pressure. And this is moving towards the venial end of the capillaries. And at this point, the hydrostatic pressure has decreased because so much liquid has been forced out. So as a result, there is a net movement of liquid back into the capillaries by osmosis at the venial end. But once equilibrium has been reached in that water potential, because water is moving back in by osmosis, there can be no more water from the tissue fluid being reabsorbed into the blood. And this is why the final parts of the tissue fluid get absorbed into the lymphatic system. And as it moves into the lymphatic system, we then call it lymph. And lymph is very similar to plasma, except it doesn't contain those large plasma proteins and some of the blood cells. Next, we have a look at the mammalian heart. And this is an organ made up of cardiac muscle, and it's responsible for pumping the blood around the body inside of different vessels. The cardiac muscle is myogenic, which means it automatically contracts and relaxes, and it will never fatigue, which is a key difference to skeletal muscles. It has coronary arteries that are run on the outside, and these supply the heart muscle, or the cardiac muscle, with oxygenated blood for aerobic respiration. And that then means ATP can be created so that the cardiac muscle can continually contract and relax. Finally, the heart is surrounded by pericardial membranes, and these are inelastic membranes that prevent the heart from filling and swelling with blood. If we go into a little bit more detail then about the internal structures of the heart, the left ventricle has a thicker muscular wall, so it can contract with more force and pump blood at higher pressure. And that is needed so that the blood can flow out of the left ventricle 
through the aorta and to the rest of the body and it ensures that the blood will reach all of the different blood vessels so that all of the body can receive oxygenated blood. The right ventricle has thinner cardiac muscle in its wall so it has less cardiac muscle and that's because it doesn't need to contract with as much force because the blood has been pumped up and out of the pulmonary arteries to the lungs and the lungs are much closer so it doesn't need that high force. But the other reason is the blood needs to flow through the lungs at lower pressure so that it doesn't cause damage to the capillaries in the lungs by the alveoli and so the blood flows slowly so there's more time for gas exchange. The atria are the two chambers at the top and we can see here that the cardiac muscle is much thinner and that's because they don't need to contract with much force at all because they are pushing the blood from the atria to the ventricles which is very very close and also it's moving down with gravity. So then if we have a look at the cardiac cycle, it can be split into three key stages. Diastole or diastole, depending how you pronounce it, atrial systole or systole, and ventricular systole or systole. Different people pronounce it different ways, but it means the same thing. Atrial systole is when the atria are contracting. Atrial diastole is when the atria are relaxing. Ventricular systole is when the ventricles contract and ventricular diastole is when the ventricles contract. So if we start here on the diagram, at this point we have both the atria and the ventricles relaxing. They're both in diastole. And because those muscles are relaxing, we've got a larger space or larger volume in the chambers. Therefore, the pressure drops and the blood is going to flow into the two atria. Now, as the blood flows in, that starts to increase the pressure and it increases the pressure high enough that it will force open the atrioventricular valves. We then get to this stage where the atria contract in atrial systole and that will then cause that contraction and force the blood from the atria into the ventricles. After that point, the atria will then relax and now the ventricles contract. And because the ventricles are now contracting, there is a higher pressure in the ventricles compared to the atria, and that causes the atrioventricular valves to shut. But when the pressure is high enough from that contraction, the semilunar valves will open. And this is what causes the blood to be pushed from the ventricles out of the pulmonary artery and the aorta. So the summary of that key information then we can see on the next few slides. We've got diastole, it's when the muscles are relaxed, the blood will enter the atria via the vena cava and the pulmonary vein. And as that blood starts to move in, it will slightly increase the pressure in the atria. Atrial systole, we have the atria muscles contracting, so the muscular walls contracting, that increases the pressure further, the atrioventricular valves open, and that causes the blood to flow into the ventricles. After a short delay, the ventricles then contract and that increases the pressure beyond that of the atria. So the atrioventricular valves close and the semilunar valves open. Now, this is a key math skill that comes up linked to this topic, cardiac output. And that is the volume of blood which leaves one ventricle in one minute. It can be calculated using the formula heart rate times stroke volume. And the heart rate is how many beats there are per minute. And the stroke volume is the volume of blood that leaves the heart each beat, typically in decimeter cubed. Next, we need to have a look at what is controlling the cardiac cycle. And by that, we mean what is controlling when the atria and the ventricle contract and relax. So first of all, cardiac muscle is myogenic. It contracts on its own accord, but the rate of contraction is controlled by a wave of electrical activity. So the sinoatrial node, or the SAN, this is located in the right atrium and it's known as the pacemaker. And I've shown this here in bright yellow. The atrioventricular node, the AVN, is located near the border of the right and the left ventricle. So just here. The bundle of His runs through the septum, which is this section. And then we have the perchyme fibres and those branch into the walls of the ventricles. So these structures are all key in the control of the cardiac cycle. So the first thing that happens is the SAN releases a wave of depolarization across the atria. So that is going to spread from the SAN across the two atria. 
the AVN releases another wave of depolarization once that first wave reaches it. But there is a non-conductive layer between the atria and the ventricles, and that prevents that wave of depolarization spreading directly down the ventricles. And instead, it forces it to move down the bundle of Hiss, because that is the part that is conductive. And once it moves down the bundle of Hiss, it then moves up through the perchyme fibres. Now, this is an advantage because as a result, it causes the apex, so the very bottom here, of the heart and the walls of the ventricle to contract. And there is a short delay before this happens. And that leaves enough time for the atria to have fully contracted and pumped the blood into the ventricles before the ventricles contract. So it's going to be more efficient way to move the blood out of the heart. The final step we have is the diastole. And this is when repolarization occurs and the cardiac muscle relaxes. The electrocardiogram or ECG is a machine that's able to measure these waves of depolarization. So we can measure it using that ECG and we can interpret it to diagnose any irregularities in heart rhythms. The ECG doesn't directly measure the electrical activity of the heart, but instead the differences in electrical activity in your skin, which is caused by the electrical activity of the heart. So the way this is done is electrodes are stuck onto the skin and those detect the electrical activity. And you should get a reading that looks something like this. However, sometimes you wouldn't get a reading that looks like that. And here are the four key abnormal heart rhythms that you need to be aware of. Tachycardia, first of all, and that is when the heart is beating over 100 beats per minute. Now that is normal if you're exercising, but if you are at rest, that is abnormally high. Bradycardia is when the heart is beating at less than 60 beats per minute. Now, many athletes do have bradycardia as they are so fit that their cardiac muscle can contract harder and therefore fewer contractions are required. But if the heart rate drops too low, an artificial pacemaker would be needed to help to regulate the heart rate. Fibrillation is when there is an irregular rhythm to the heart. And ectopic heartbeat is when there are additional heartbeats that are not in rhythm. It is actually very common for this to occur once a day, but if it is happening more regularly, it could indicate a serious health condition. We then move on to haemoglobin, and haemoglobins are a group of globular proteins that lots of different organisms have. And this protein is a quaternary structure, meaning it's made up of four polypeptide chains, and it's responsible for transporting oxygen. Some organisms also have myoglobin, which is actually only made up of one polypeptide chain. And this is often found in muscle tissues in vertebrates. So an oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve is a way for us to view the percentage saturation of hemoglobin with oxygen. And that's normally shown against different partial pressures of oxygen. So what this graph shows us is at high partial pressures of oxygen, the haemoglobin is at about 100% saturation, so it is fully loaded with oxygen. However, at low partial pressures of oxygen, we have much lower percentage saturations, and that indicates that oxygen is being unloaded. And this would typically be representing different parts of the body. So you'd have a low partial pressure of oxygen in respiring cells or respiring tissues because they're using up the oxygen. So it is an advantage then that the haemoglobin unloads that oxygen and therefore it becomes less saturated because the oxygen can be used in respiration. And in the alveoli where there's a really high partial pressure of oxygen, you have a high saturation. So where there's lots of oxygen available, the haemoglobin will load on lots to then transport it around. So this graph is showing us changes in affinity and affinity is referring to the attraction. So at high partial pressures of oxygen, haemoglobin has a high affinity for oxygen. At low partial pressures of oxygen, haemoglobin has a lower affinity. This also links to the concept of cooperative binding. And this cooperative nature of oxygen binding to haemoglobin is due to the haemoglobin changing shape. So we can see here that when first oxygen must be binding, 
it must be harder because we have got a less steep curve on the graph. But when that first oxygen binds, it actually causes the shape of that protein, the haemoglobin, to change and it exposes the further binding sites of oxygen more. And that's why the curve is much steeper at this point. It's easier for the second and the third oxygens to bind. It then starts to level off because we now only have one binding site of the four remaining. So again, that reduces the likelihood of it binding because you've only got a one in four chance of colliding at the right position. The Bohr effect is when high carbon dioxide concentration causes the oxyhemoglobin curve to shift to the right. So we've got here pH 7.6. But then if we decrease the pH to 7.4 or decrease it further to 7.2, each time that curve has shifted to the right. And this indicates that the affinity that haemoglobin has for oxygen is decreasing. And we can tell that because if we have a look at the same partial pressure, but compare the two curves, for the top one, at a low partial pressure of carbon dioxide, which is indicated by the pH. The curve is further to the left. We have a higher affinity and therefore more oxygen is loaded. But at that same partial pressure of oxygen, but with a lower pH, which would indicate there must be more carbon dioxide present because that is what affects the pH, the curve has shifted to the right. And that means that even at the same partial pressure of oxygen, far less oxygen is bound. So it must be unloading more oxygen. And this is an advantage because if you have high levels of carbon dioxide, it indicates it's the site of respiration. So if you're unloading oxygen at that location, there will be a constant supply of oxygen for aerobic respiration to continue. You might also be asked to compare the haemoglobins of different organisms and link it to their environments. So we can have a look at these four. We're starting with a human fetus. And these different labels that we have are, first of all, HBA means adult haemoglobin, HBF means fetal haemoglobin, and then we've got myoglobin, which is a different type of protein altogether. So we're just going to focus on the blue and the green line. Fetal haemoglobin, which is the haemoglobin that a fetus has, the curve has shifted to the left. And that tells us that even at the same partial pressure of oxygen, it is more saturated with oxygen, the haemoglobin is. So it must have a higher affinity. And that's beneficial because the fetus has to be able to get oxygen from the mother's haemoglobin. So it's an advantage that the fetus's haemoglobin has a higher affinity than the adult haemoglobin because it's able to then remove oxygen from the haemoglobin of an adult and it will bind to the fetus's haemoglobin instead. Llamas live at very high altitudes. So they also have a higher affinity. So their haemoglobin has a higher affinity for oxygen. So even though they are in environments with a lower partial pressure, their haemoglobin can still load up oxygen and become saturated. The haemoglobin of a dove has a lower affinity for oxygen. And we can see that because the curve has shifted to the right. So even at the same partial pressure, it is less saturated, meaning that more oxygen must have been unloaded. And this is an advantage because animals like doves, which have faster metabolisms, will require more oxygen for respiration to be able to provide the energy for the muscle contraction. Lastly, then we have the earthworm. And earthworms are typically underground where there is a lower partial pressure of oxygen. So they need to be able to load oxygen onto the haemoglobin, even though they are in an environment with a low partial pressure. So it's an advantage to them that their haemoglobin has a higher affinity for oxygen. Lastly, it's looking at how carbon dioxide can be transported. And there are three key ways. It could be dissolved in the blood plasma as haemoglobinic acid, or the carbon dioxide could react with amino acids in the haemoglobin to form haemoglobinic acid. Lastly, it could be in the cytoplasm of red blood cells in the form of hydrogen carbonate ions. Now, Almost 85% of carbon dioxide is transported as hydrogen carbonate ions in red blood cells. Water and carbon dioxide react in a reversible reaction to form hydrogen ions and hydrogen carbonate ions. 
carbonic anhydrase, an enzyme in the cytoplasm of red blood cells, catalyzes that reaction. That carbonic acid can diffuse out of the red blood cells and exchange chloride ions diffuse into the red blood cells. Both of these ions are negative, so this exchange maintains the electrical balance of red blood cells known as the chloride shift. 3.13 transport in plants. So the main substances transported en masse in plants are water and organic substances, meaning anything containing carbon, which is going to be the products of photosynthesis. These are transported either by the xylem or the phloem, which collectively are described as the vascular bundle. So we're gonna start by looking at the structure of the xylem and the phloem. The phloem tissue is made up of two key cells. We have the sieve tube elements, and then next to those are the companion cells. The sieve tube elements are living cells, but they contain no nucleus, very few organelles, and they have got these perforated end walls. And this is to assist in the mass transport of fluids. Because they are lacking lots of organelles though, they are dependent on the companion cells, which are next to them, to provide the ATP required for active transport of the organic substances into that sieve tube element. Xylem cells, on the other hand, are dead cells and they are also hollow. And here we're looking at a cross section through a xylem in a very thin slice under the microscope. They do not contain any organelles or end walls. And as a result, they stack up on each other to create a continuous hollow column much like a hose pipe, ideal for transporting water and mineral ions. The xylem wall is also strengthened with a waterproof chemical called lignin. So if we have a look at the transport of water, the first thing is knowing the transport of water into the plants. Now this happens from the soil into the root hair cells and the water is absorbed by osmosis. Root hair cells are adapted to maximize absorption by osmosis by having very thin walls to reduce that diffusion pathway and also they have those long protrusions providing a large surface area. Once that water is then inside of the root hair cells, it needs to move from that root hair cell to the xylem to be moved en masse. And that can either be through the symplast or apoplast pathway. The symplast pathway is when the water moves through the cytoplasm of a cell. The water will move from cell to cell towards the xylem, by osmosis through the cytoplasm, and also through gaps in each cell wall, which is called a plasmodesmata. Each successive cell cytoplasm has a lower water potential, and this is why the water is able to continually move from cell to cell towards the xylem by osmosis. The apoplast pathway is when the water moves through the cell walls. Water can enter the cell wall and move due to cohesive forces. The water molecules stick together because of the hydrogen bonding, and they form a continuous stream of water, which move towards the xylem. This pathway transports water much faster as there is little resistance to the water in the cell wall. The adaptations that some plants have to either very, very high or low quantities of water are also required. So in plants, gas exchange happens through the stomata, and stomata are tiny pores, mainly on the lower sides of the leaves. And these can open and close, which is determined by guard cells. And this opening and closing is a mechanism to try and prevent excessive water loss by evaporation. Xerophytes are extreme files which have adaptations to reduce water loss and are therefore found in environments with limited water, for example, the desert. Or marron grass, which is also an example of a xerophyte, is found on the sand dunes. And despite it being next to the ocean, there is still limited water due to the sand being so porous. So if we have a look at some of the adaptations that marron grass, an example of a xerophyte, has. First of all, we've got these curled leaves and that traps moisture and therefore it increases the humidity within this space. Because there's an increased humidity, that decreases the water potential gradient and it reduces evaporation. So we can see that we've got not only the curls, but there are also these hair-like structures which would also trap that moist air and increase the humidity. The stomata are sunken in and that again increases the local humidity to reduce the water potential gradient. On the outside there is also a thicker cuticle to reduce the water loss by evaporation. In addition to this, to help gain more water, 
it will have a longer root network so that there is more reach to be able to absorb more water by osmosis. Hydrophytes are the opposites. These are plants which live in or on water, so they require adaptations to survive in an excess of water. Water lilies are an example of hydrophytes which grow on the surface of water. The adaptations include short roots, very thin to no waxy cuticle, and stomata being permanently open and on the top surface of the leaf. These adaptations assure that no additional water is retained in the plant and efficient water loss occurs. Adaptations to ensure enough light is still absorbed for photosynthesis include the leaves being really, really large and wide on the surface of the water. So next then we're looking at what is transpiration. And this is when water vapor is lost from a leaf via the stomata. So it's the evaporation of water vapor from the stomata. And you need to know about the different conditions that will affect the rate of transpiration. We can have a look at those different conditions but be aware as well that to measure these changes in rate, you would need to use a piece of apparatus called a potometer. So here are four key factors that affect the rate of transpiration. With a higher light intensity, the light will cause the stomata to open more. Therefore, there's a larger surface area for evaporation. With a higher temperature, the water molecules will gain kinetic energy move faster and therefore there'd be increased evaporation. There is a negative correlation between the effect of humidity and the rate. The more water vapour in the air, so the more humid the air, that will make the water potential more positive outside of the leaf and it therefore reduces the water potential gradient and transpiration. There's a positive correlation with wind, meaning the more windy it is, it will blow away the humid air containing that water vapour and that will help to maintain the water potential gradient and increase transpiration. This leads into looking at the water of movement up the xylem. So water moves up a plant from the roots against gravity, and in the case of trees, that could be several meters against gravity. And this is only possible because of the cohesion tension theory. And this is split into a few different concepts to be aware of. Cohesion of water, capillarity or adhesion of water and root pressure. So if we start with cohesion, this links back to the properties of water being polar or dipolar, meaning that we've got these two different charged regions. And because of those different charged regions, hydrogen bonds can form between the hydrogen and the oxygen of different water molecules. And that's what these dashed lines are showing. Those water molecules sticking together or cohesing is what creates this continuous column of water in the xylem. Adhesion of water is when water is sticking to other molecules. So water can adhere to the walls of the xylem, for example. Now it's not actually shown in the middle here, but you would have a continuous column of water attached to each other, but also to the walls of the xylem. In this image, I'm just emphasizing that it does attach to the xylem walls to really show this impact. And the narrower the xylem, that would mean the larger surface area in contact with the water and therefore stronger adhesion. So we'll actually see this happen in our cohesion tension theory, but as transpiration increases, it can actually cause the xylem to become narrower. And as it gets narrower, that increases adhesion. So we'll come back to that concept. The final thing to consider is root pressure. And this is as water moves into the roots by osmosis, you're increasing the volume of liquid in that space. And that will increase the pressure. Because the pressure is quite high in the roots, it pushes up all of the water above it. So we have this upwards or positive pressure. So we need to look at how these three concepts link together to result in cohesion tension theory, which is what causes water to move up the xylem. So the first thing that happens is water will evaporate out of the stomata of the leaves and as water is being removed there will be a lower volume of liquid in the leaves and that causes the pressure to decrease. Because the pressure decreases water will move in to fill its space so more water is then pulled up the xylem to replace it because of that negative pressure. Now this water is all stuck together due to the hydrogen bonds, so they are cohesive. And we have this continuous column of water being pulled up the xylem 
replacing the water as it transpires. But because the water molecules are also stuck or adhering to the walls of the xylem, as the water column is being pulled up and the water is stuck to the walls of the xylem, it pulls the water column upwards and the walls of the xylem inwards. And that makes the walls of the xylem closer together and therefore the lumen is narrower. So it's this tension of the water being pulled upwards in that continuous column that pulls the xylem to be narrower. Now, because it's narrower, that adhesion will have a bigger impact. And we've also got the root pressure pushing the water up. And those three properties together are what ensure we get this continuous column of water moving up the xylem against gravity. The second type of transport is the transport of the organic substances produced in photosynthesis. So that's what we're going to be looking at, how those organic substances are transported around the plant through the phloem. So we've already had a look at the structure of the phloem, and this then leads us into translocation. And this is the transport of organic substances in plants. And this process requires energy. It's an active process. It revolves around this idea that we have the mass flow from the source, and the source is where the organic substance is made, so in photosynthesizing cells. And we have the mass flow from that source to the sink. And the sink is the site where the organic substances are going to be used in respiration. So you can look at this model here, the source to sink explanation. It's a very simplified version, but it demonstrates what is happening. We've got our source cell, which we said is the photosynthesizing cell. And that will be connected via the phloem to a sink cell, which is a respiring cell. And we have the xylem next to the phloem in the vascular bundle. But to help represent this, we're just saying it's in a tank of water. So when that cell is photosynthesizing, we're going to be producing sucrose, which lowers the water potential of the cell. Therefore, water would move from the xylem into that cell. At the other end, the respiring cell is using up sucrose and therefore it has a more positive water potential compared to the surroundings and water would leave the sink cell by osmosis. So what that does to the hydrostatic pressure is at the source cell where water is moving in, the hydrostatic pressure will increase and at the sink cell where water is moving out, the hydrostatic pressure would decrease. So as a result, the source cell has a comparatively higher hydrostatic pressure than the sink cell so the liquids within those cells are forced through the phloem towards the sink cell. Now, looking at a bit more detail of what is actually going on takes us into the next stages of translocation. So we've already said that the photosynthesizing cell is the source cell. And at that point, organic substances are being created by photosynthesis, for example, sucrose. And that's what's shown in this image in the red. So those red circles are sucrose. We have a high concentration of sucrose at the site of production for photosynthesis. Therefore, the sucrose diffuses down its concentration gradient into the companion cell via facilitated diffusion. Now, at this point, we have the active co-transport. And different textbooks will go into this in different levels of detail. Sometimes it's sufficient just to say that the sucrose is actively or co-transported from the source cell into the sieve tube element, but other sources will go into this level of detail um, where it tells you that there's an active transport of hydrogen ions from the companion cell into these spaces within the cell walls, and this uses energy because it's active transport. It creates a concentration gradient, and therefore the hydrogen ions move down their concentration gradient via carrier proteins into the sieve tube element. Now, the co transport is the sucrose will be co-transported with those hydrogen ions via the protein co-transporters. And that's how we get the sucrose into the sieve tube element. Once it's in the sieve tube element, that is now going to be decreasing the water potential. And as a result, water from the xylem will move into the phloem by osmosis. That will increase the hydrostatic pressure at this end of the sieve tube element. At the same time, sucrose is being used in respiration at the sink, or it might be stored as insoluble starch. 
That means that more sucrose is going to be actively transported into the sink cell, which causes the water potential to decrease at this end. And as a result, water will move from the sieve tube element back into the xylem. So this means that at this end of the sieve tube element, we have a much lower hydrostatic pressure. So as a result, we've got a high pressure, a low pressure, we'll have the movement of solutes down that pressure gradient, and that is what causes the solution to move through the flower. But we're going to be starting with communication and homeostasis. So we start with just our definition of homeostasis, the maintenance of a constant internal environment via physiological control systems. And the control systems that you need to be aware of are keeping the body at the same temperature, maintaining the same blood pH, blood glucose concentration, and the blood water potential. So all of those within set limits. Homeostasis involves both negative and positive feedback loops. So a negative feedback loop is the most common one that we see. And this is when a deviation from the set limits is detected in the body, and that'll be detected by a receptor, and then mechanisms are put in place to bring those conditions back within the set limits. So we can see here an example of that with regulating the body temperature. It involves the nerve system and also it often involves hormones as well. In contrast, positive feedback is actually quite rare and this is when a deviation from the set limits triggers a response to increase the deviation from that set limit even further. So a good example to demonstrate this is during childbirth and when the baby's head presses on the cervix, it causes the hormone oxytocin to be released and that release and deviation from the set limit of that hormone causes the uterus to contract but it results in even more oxytocin being released so even more contractions in the uterus so if we start now with an example which is thermoregulation and the reason that we have to maintain the temperature in our body is if the temperature was too low there wouldn't be enough kinetic energy for enzyme controlled reactions and if the temperature was too hot enzymes would denature and then reactions would also stop so it's really important either way so that metabolic reactions continue at a fast enough rate so that cells don't die. So ectotherms and endotherms regulate their temperature in different ways. Ectotherms can't actually regulate their internal temperature and instead they control it through changing their behavior. Most animals are actually ectotherms. So for example, fish, amphibians, reptiles, and invertebrates are all ectotherms. And within an aquatic environment, they don't really have to do any regulation of body temperatures. And that links back to what we learned about water in an earlier topic. Water has a high specific heat capacity. So it acts as a temperature buffer because it takes a lot of energy to raise or decrease the temperature and therefore it remains relatively constant. However, ectotherms that live on land do have a bigger challenge because the temperature of air can fluctuate. And this is why terrestrial cold-blooded animals bask on hot rocks to keep warm as they can absorb radiating heat from the sun. Endotherms, in contrast, do regulate their internal body temperature using the nervous system. And this is done through a whole range of mechanisms. If we start by looking at the receptors, the peripheral receptors are in the skin and that detects a change in the external temperature. That would then send an impulse along the sensory neurons of the brain where the hypothalamus coordinates that impulse. And that would trigger a range of responses linked to either glands or muscles. So for example, the sweat glands, if you were hot, would produce more sweat and that would provide a cooling impact. Vasodilation and vasoconstriction are both linked to muscles and it's to do with the arterioles in the skin either having more contraction or less contraction to result in the dilation or the constriction of those blood vessels and that controls the amount of blood flow to the surface of the skin and that will then control the amount of heat energy that can radiate from that blood close to the skin surface. So if you were hot then you would undergo vasodilation to increase the amount of heat radiating if you were cold, you would go through vasoconstriction and that results in less heat energy radiating from the skin. Shivering is also an example of muscle response and it's the contracting and the relaxing of skeletal muscle. And that will increase the rate of respiration and therefore more heat energy would be released. 
Now, animals that have a lot of fur or feathers can also raise their fur or feathers upwards, and that will then trap a layer of air to insulate. Or if they're really hot, they would then lower the fur and hair so that less air is being trapped to prevent less of an insulating layer. And the muscles that are involved in this response are the erector pili muscles within the skin. The last option here is to do with modifications in behavior. And we see that in humans, for example, moving to the shade if you're hot or taking off clothes if you're hot, using a fan. But you also see it in other animals. So other animals will also move to the shade if they're hot and penguins huddle when they're cold. So we now move on to 5.1.2, excretion as an example of homeostatic control. Metabolic reactions, which are continuously happen, create waste products, which can become toxic if they are not removed. And the removal of this waste product is known as excretion. The two key examples that you need to be familiar with are carbon dioxide and nitrogenous waste. Carbon dioxide is the waste product from respiration and it's excreted from the lungs when you exhale. Nitrogenous waste, for example urea, is created from excess amino acids in the diet. And unlike glucose, excess amino acids can't actually be stored and used at a later date. And that means amino acids are broken down and that happens in the liver. And they're broken down to ammonia, which is toxic, and then urea. That urea, if it's in a high enough concentration, would also be toxic. So it gets excreted through the kidneys. Now, mammals produce urea as nitrogenous waste, but fish produce ammonia and birds produce uric acid. So we said that the liver has a role in that formation of urea, but it actually also is involved in glycogen, where we have the glucose being stored away as glycogen, and the breakdown of other toxins, so detoxification. And in order to do this, the liver contains a range of enzymes. It's a very large organ, and it receives oxygenated blood through the hepatic artery, and the blood leaves the liver through the hepatic vein. The hepatic portal vein also supplies the liver with blood and that is supplying blood from the digestive system. So you need to be not only aware of the functions but the structure and the histology of the liver. So liver cells are called hepatocytes. They have many mitochondria, large nuclei and prominent Golgi apparatus. And these adaptations enable a really high metabolic rate. So here we're going to look at the structure and the histology of the liver. So we can see the liver here, and that is made up of these functional units called lobules. And that is all of these hexagon shapes that we can see. And this is then zooming in on one of those lobules. So a lobule is essentially like the equivalent of the nephron in the kidney. It's where all the action is happening. And we can see then on this lobule that the blood is delivered to the lobule through the hepatic portal vein and the hepatic artery. And that's what we've got here, the portal veins, which is bringing the blood from the digestive system, rich in everything that's just been absorbed from digestion. And then we've got the hepatic arteries as well, shown in red, bringing the blood as well. And then the blood that's been delivered from the hepatic artery and the hepatic portal vein is then going to mix in these vessels that we can see here, which are essentially spaces that are surrounding the hepatocytes, which are the cells of the liver. And that is where we have blood from the hepatic arteries and the hepatic portal mains mixing. So we actually have oxygenated and deoxygenated blood mixing at that point. Now it's important because the blood delivered from the hepatic artery is really highly oxygenated. And this oxygen can mix with the blood from the hepatic portal vein. So therefore we have at least partially oxygenated blood at this point. Now that is going to run through those sinusoids past all of these hepatocytes, which we're going to look at their role shortly. And then it all drains into the hepatic vein. So all of that blood eventually drains in the hepatic vein and then it gets transferred away. Now a little bit more then about the structure. This is showing you an entire lobule and we're going to zoom in now on just like one segment within that lobule. And here's just one segment. And this is the outside where we have the hepatic artery. And in this case, it's an arteriole. We have the hepatic portal vein leading to a venule. Now, the first thing is you need to be able to identify these. And the way you can actually do that is by looking at the thickness of the wall. The hepatic arteriole will have a thicker wall compared to the hepatic portal venule. And as we said, those will be delivering deoxygenated blood from the hepatic portal venule 
oxygenated blood from the hepatic arteriole and that mixes in those spaces in the middle called the sinusoid and that all eventually drains towards the hepatic vein. We do have a final section here shown in green and this is the bile duct and the way we can tell it's a bile duct and not one of the blood vessels is it doesn't have a wall, instead it is surrounded by hepatocyte cells. So let's have a look at some of this information then. To protect against disease, within those sinusoids, there are Kupfer cells. And those Kupfer cells are able to help destroy any pathogens that might enter. So they're a bit like macrophages and engulf those foreign particles. The hepatocytes, which are the cells that make up the liver, which are shown in grey in this image, they produce bile. And they'll be using the products from breaking down old blood and blood cells to do that. The bile is first secreted from those hepatocytes into spaces called canaliculi, for plural or for singular, a canaliculus. And we've just got one here, so this is our canaliculus. And the bile is produced in the hepatocytes secreted into this canaliculus and then it drains and moves down into that bile duct and from the bile duct it will then go to the gallbladder where it is stored. So some other functions then to talk about the hepatocytes which were those liver cells in response to insulin they can also absorb excess glucose from the blood and convert it to glycogen. In response to glucagon the hepatocytes will hydrolyze glycogen back into glucose and release it into the blood. Detoxification also happens here, and this is the neutralization and breakdown of unwanted chemicals such as alcohol, drugs, hormones, and toxins produced in metabolism. As we've already said, many metabolic reactions produce toxins, and the liver contains enzymes that can break those down into non-toxic substances. Finally, the ornithine cycle, which is the urea cycle, is also occurring here. And this is how specifically the waste substance urea is produced from ammonia, which we'd already mentioned is what excess amino acids are broken down into. And this will then be ready to transport that urea to the kidneys for excretion. So excess proteins from our diet, as we said earlier, cannot be stored. And instead they go to the liver to be deaminated. And deamination is when the amine group is removed from the amino acids. And that is what converts into ammonia. Ammonia is highly toxic, which is why it has to be converted to urea before it's then transported in the blood to be released. Urea is also toxic, but only in very high concentrations, which it shouldn't be in, because when the blood gets to the kidney, the urea is filtered out. Now that leads us into the kidney. This is responsible for the excretion of that urea, the nitrogenous waste, and also osmoregulation, which is the process of controlling the water potential of the blood. In this case, it's the renal artery that supplies the kidney with blood to be filtered. And we can see that here shown in red. There's our renal artery entering. And the renal vein is going to be taking that filtered blood away. Kidneys are made up of three distinct layers. We have the cortex, the medulla, and the pelvis. The cortex is the dark outer layer that contains many capillary networks carrying blood from the renal arteries to the nephrons. The medulla is this section here, and that contains the nephrons. The pelvis, which is shown here in yellow, is where the urine collects before leaving the kidney and traveling to the ureter. So if we focus then on the structure of the nephron. You have two kidneys, and we just looked at the structure of those kidneys, and within the medulla, you have millions of nephrons. And the nephrons are the structures within the kidney where the blood is filtered and then useful substances are reabsorbed back into the blood. The blood is filtered here to remove waste, but to selectively reabsorb useful substances back into the blood. So in terms of the structure, we have the Bowman's capsule, which is on the outside of the glomerulus, and that is where ultrafiltration occurs. That then leads into the proximal convoluted tubule. And we're going to look at how glucose is reabsorbed after it's been filtered at that point. We then have that leading into the loop of Henle. And here sodium ions are actively transported out of the ascending limb, which is the one going up into the medulla to create a lower water potential. And then water is then going to be moving out by osmosis from the descending limb of the loop of Henle as well as it will continue to move out from the distal convoluted tubule 
and also the collecting ducts. And that's all due to water potential gradients. So eventually any remaining liquid in the collecting duct that goes on to form the urine. And that liquid will contain water, dissolved salts, urea, and other substances such as hormones. So in a little bit more detail, we said that the ultrafiltration is happening in that Bowman's capsule or the renal capsule. And that is because within that capsule, there are lots of blood vessels, which we call the glomerulus. And blood enters through an afferent arteriole, and that splits into lots of smaller capillaries, making up that glomerulus. Because you are going from a wider diameter arteriole into smaller diameter capillaries, that creates a high hydrostatic pressure of the blood. And water and small molecules are then forced out of the tiny gaps between the capillary walls. And that forms the glomerulus filtrate. Once the fluid is forced out of those capillary walls, it then passes through a basement membrane. The first image is showing you the capillaries. We've got the blood and the red blood cells flowing through those capillaries. And there's these tiny gaps in the capillary walls that the small molecules and water are forced out of. Then after the capillaries, as we can see in this image, there is another layer, which is the basement membrane. And that's made up of a network of collagen fibers and proteins. And the fluid then has to pass through that basement membrane. And that acts like a sieve. Now, the Bowman's capsule wall also has podocytes, which are special cells that act as an additional filter. So that's what we can see here, these podocyte cells that surround that basement membrane. So large protein and blood cells are too big to fit through the gaps in the capillary endothelium. They remain in the blood and this blood then leaves via the efferent arteriole. After that glomerulus filtrate has been formed in that Bowman's capsule, it enters the proximal convoluted tubule. And at this point, almost all of the filtrate is reabsorbed back into the blood, leaving just urea, excess mineral ions and water behind. Now, one of the key things that's filtered out that gets reabsorbed is glucose and small amino acids as well. But we're just going to focus on the glucose in particular. And the way this gets reabsorbed in the proximal convoluted tubule is almost identical to how it is absorbed in the small intestines is co-transport. So the concentration of sodium ions within these epithelial cells of the proximal convoluted tubule cell is decreased as sodium ions are actively transported out of that cell and into the blood capillaries. Now, due to the concentration gradient of the sodium ions in that PCT cell compared to the lumen of the PCT, that results in the sodium ions being able to move down their concentration gradient into the cell by facilitated diffusion. But this happens through a co-transporter protein and glucose is co-transported in with those sodium ions. And in this way, any of the glucose that was forced out in ultrafiltration that is now in this glomerular filtrate in the lumen of the proximal convoluted tubule, it gets reabsorbed into the proximal convoluted tubule cell and then by facilitated diffusion it will enter the bloodstream and in that way almost all of the glucose is reabsorbed from the filtrate back into the blood and that's important because glucose is not a waste product it is needed for respiration and if there's too much of it it can be stored in the liver as glycogen so now that filtrate will enter the loop of henley and the loop of Henley plays a key role in maintaining a sodium ion gradient and therefore water being reabsorbed. So the filtrate passes into the loop of Henley and it's going to enter first of all the descending limb, which in this image is shown on the right hand side. Sometimes you might have an image where you don't have this overlap in the tubes, so therefore it appears on the left hand side. But the key thing is it's connected to the PCT and the tube goes down first. So that is the descending loop of Henle. That then leads into the ascending limb of the loop of Henle. And mitochondria in the walls of the cells provide energy to actively transport sodium ions out of the ascending limb of the loop of Henle. So lots of sodium ions are being actively transported out. And as a result, this space in the medulla there'll be an accumulation of sodium ions and that lowers the water potential of the medulla compared to the water potential in the filtrate. 
So that then means that as more of that filtrate is passing down the descending limb, the water from that filtrate is going to diffuse out by osmosis into this interstitial space in the medulla. And that water, once it's in the medulla, will then be reabsorbed back into the capillaries. At the base of the ascending limb, some of the sodium ions are transported out by diffusion as there's now a very dilute solution as the solution surrounding the loop of Henle is now quite dilute because of all the water that has moved out by osmosis. So that filtrate now will enter the distal convoluted tubule. And due to all of those sodium ions that have been actively transported out of the loop of Henle, when the filtrate reaches the top of that loop of Henle, it's very, very dilute when it enters the distal convoluted tubule. So that filtrate moves into the distal convoluted tubule, and this section of the medulla is actually very concentrated. So there is a very low water potential on the outside of the distal convoluted tubule. And therefore, even more water is going to diffuse out of the distal convoluted tubule and out of the collecting duct. That water will then be reabsorbed into the blood. So anything that remains in the collecting duct then goes on to form urine. So that is how the kidneys filter the blood. But the kidneys also have a role in regulating the water potential of the blood. And this involves negative feedback and also the brain. The hypothalamus within the brain, which we can see here, detects changes in water potential. And that is because of receptors that are found in this location called osmoreceptors. If the water potential of the blood is too low, water moves out of those osmoreceptors by osmosis and it causes them to shrivel. And that stimulates the hypothalamus to produce more of the hormone ADH. So the hypothalamus constantly produces ADH, but it will produce more of that hormone if the water potential of the blood is low. If the water potential of the blood is too high, water will enter those osmoreceptors by osmosis, and that stimulates the hypothalamus to produce less ADH. So the hypothalamus is where the hormone is produced, but that hormone is then transported to the posterior pituitary gland, and it's from there that it is released into the blood. The ADH will then travel through the blood to its target organ, which is the kidney. ADH, or antidiuretic hormone, will bind to complementary receptors that are only located in the kidney, specifically on the cells in the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting duct. When it binds, it activates the enzyme adenocyclase, and that makes cyclic AMP, or CAMP. This activates an enzyme which causes vesicles containing proteins, known as aquaporins, to fuse with the membrane. And those aquaporins are channel proteins that allow water to be transported from the collecting duct or the distal convoluted tubule back into the blood. So as a result, the membrane becomes more permeable to water and more water will leave to be reabsorbed into the blood. So that's what we can see happening here with those aquaporins. And as we said, that causes more water to leave the nephron from the distal convoluted tubule or from the collecting duct to be reabsorbed back into the blood in the capillaries. And that means that the urine that remains in that collecting duct will be more concentrated and there'll be a lower volume. So if we just quickly summarize then this negative feedback, we've got the water potential of the blood increases, meaning there's too much water in your blood. That's detected by osmoreceptors in the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus will then release less ADH, which is released by the posterior pituitary gland into the blood. That hormone will then bind to the receptors on the cells in the DCT and the collecting duct walls. That means there'll be less of that hormone attaching to the DCT and collecting duct walls, so fewer aquaporins are embedding, so the walls are less permeable to water. That means less water is reabsorbed back into the blood and instead it remains in the urine. So you have larger volumes of dilute urine and that brings your water potential back to the normal set limits. In contrast, if you don't have enough water in your blood, that means the water potential of the blood has decreased. That will be detected by osmoreceptors in the hypothalamus and cause an increase in the release of ADH from the hypothalamus. And that will mean more of that hormone is released by the posterior pituitary gland into the blood. That causes the DCT in the collecting duct walls to become more permeable to water. 
more water is reabsorbed into the blood and less is lost in the urine. And that then brings our water potential back within its normal levels. Now, urine can actually be used for diagnosing a range of things. The fact that urine is composed of substances filtered out of the blood is why it can be used for this. So it can be tested for diabetes, pregnancy, the presence of anabolic steroids, and also other drugs. Pregnancy tests uses monoclonal antibodies to detect the presence of the human growth hormone, which is produced by pregnant women. A monoclonal antibody is a single type of antibody that can be isolated and cloned. So in our pregnancy test, which we can see over here, at point A, we have a urine sample, and there is an absorbent piece of paper at the end of the test. So the absorbent end of the pregnancy test is absorbed in the urine. That urine is then absorbed and it moves up the pregnancy test. And at position B of the pregnancy test, we have a mobile monoclonal antibody. And that monoclonal antibody is complementary in shape to the human growth hormone, which you only produce if you're pregnant. So in this case, the person is pregnant and the human growth hormone is in the urine and it binds to those mobile monoclonal antibodies, which have a colored dye attached to them. As the urine moves up the paper, those mobile antibodies move with it. And at position C, there is a second monoclonal antibody, but this one is immobilized in this fixed position. It's also complementary to the human growth hormone. So if any of the first antibodies do have it attached, they will bind at this point and stay in that fixed position. And because those have got colored dye on them, you get a blue strip. Now at the very end at position D, there is a third antibody which is immobilized. And this is complementary in shape to the constant region of the first antibody. So that means any of those antibodies that are moving along will attach and you get a second blue line. And that is our control strip just to show that the pregnancy test is working and that those antibodies at position B are moving. So if you have two lines, it indicates you're pregnant. One line, you are not pregnant. Anabolic steroids are also excreted in urine and therefore they can be tested for in a similar way to this, along with many other drugs that are excreted in your urine. They could also be tested in a similar way. Now, sometimes the kidneys do fail and there are many causes of kidney failure, which could be infection, high blood pressure, genetic conditions, or even physical damage. Kidney infections and high blood pressure can damage the tubules podocytes, epithelial cells, and the basement membranes of the Bowman's capsule. And as a result, that would affect the filtration and large molecules would be able to filter out of the blood as well, such as proteins, large proteins, and red blood cells. If the kidney completely fails, then the blood will not be filtered properly. And this can lead to a buildup of urea and blood and an electrolyte imbalance. The glomolar filtrate rate, or GFR, is affected by kidney failure and can be measured as an indication of disease. And this is measured indirectly by testing the blood for creatine levels. And creatine is a breakdown product of muscles. If the levels of creatine in the blood increase, it indicates that the kidneys are not filtering properly. So your options for treatment are two types of dialysis. We've got hemodialysis, which is the one which is connecting your body to the machine and the blood is going to come out of your body and the machine itself filters it. Whereas peritoneal dialysis occurs within the body and it utilizes the peritoneum, which is the lining of the abdomen, to act as a natural dialysis membrane. In both instances, you have a dialysis fluid, which is there to make sure that anything that needs to be filtered out is going to diffuse from the blood into the dialysis fluid. Now, these are quite successful in filtering the blood. However, long-term dialysis can have really harmful side effects, and therefore the best treatment would be a kidney transplant. However, there are a lack of available donors, and there's always the risk of organ rejection. So if you do have a kidney transplant, you would have to be on immunosuppressant drugs for life to reduce the risk of rejection. And because you're on immunosuppressant drugs, you are more at risk of getting ill from infections. The other thing to be aware of is most transplanted kidneys are only going to work for about 10 years. So you might then have to have a second organ transplant. Then we move on to communication involving neurons and the nervous system. So we'll start by looking at the neurons. The nervous system is made up of billions of neurons, and these can be categorized into sensory, relay, and motor neurons. All three have some common features, 
They all have a cell body which contains the organelles found in a typical animal cell, including the nucleus. They also have proteins and neurotransmitters which are made in the cell body. Dendrons carry the action potential to surrounding cells, and they all have an axon which is a conductive long fibre that carries the nerve's impulse along the motor neuron. You also need to be aware about myelinated neurons, and a myelinated neuron has a Schwann cell which wraps around the axon to form a myelin sheath. And that's what we can see here. The yellow is representing that myelin sheath. And that is a lipid, and therefore it does not allow charged ions to pass through it. So in that way, it prevents the conduction of the electrical impulse. There are gaps between these myelin sheaths, and these are called the nodes of Bramvir. The action potential therefore has to jump from node to node, and that is known as saltatory conduction. And that means that the action potential travels much faster because it's only been generated at a number of positions instead of at every single distance along the entire axon. Now, knowing the different structures of the three is key as well. So the sensory neurons, these carry electrical impulses from the sensory receptor cell to the relay neurons, and also sometimes to the motor neuron and the brain. They have a long dendron, which carries the impulse from the sensory receptor cell to the cell body, and then an axon to carry the impulse to the next neuron. The relay neurons carry impulses between the sensory and the motor neurons. They have multiple short axons and dendrons. A motor neuron carries the impulse from a relay or a sensory neuron to the effector, which will be a muscle or a gland. And they have one long axon and multiple short dendrons. So the sensory receptor cells are responsible for detecting a stimulus. And these cells are transducers because they'll convert different types of stimuli into electrical nerve impulses. There are different types of sensory receptors and each of them can detect a different stimulus. So here are three key examples and the stimulus that they can detect. So let's have a look then at the Pacinian corpuscule. These pressure receptors are located deep in the skin, mainly in the fingers and the feet. The sensory neuron in the Pacinian corpuscule has a special channel protein in its plasma membrane. So that's what we're looking at here. The Pacinian corpuscule is essentially a sensory neuron that is wrapped up in lots and lots of layers of lamellae. Now those membranes of the Pacinian corpuscule that are wrapping around the end of this sensory neuron have stretch mediated sodium channels. So these are protein channels embedded within the membrane that will open when there is pressure applied and therefore stretching the membrane. And when those channels open, sodium ions will enter and if enough sodium ions diffuse in, it will generate an action potential. So in that way, when the pressure is applied and it deforms the neural membrane, it stretches and widens open those sodium ion channels to generate an action potential. If there is enough stretch to enable enough sodium ions to enter to reach plus 40 millivolts. When a neuron is not conducting an impulse, there is a difference between the electrical charge inside and outside of the neuron. And this is known as the resting potential. There are more positive ions, so sodium and potassium ions, outside of the neuron compared to inside of the neuron. And therefore, the inside of the neuron is comparatively more negative at minus 70 millivolts. So that's what we're seeing on this graph. The potential difference or the voltage at this point when there is no stimulus, it remains constant at minus 70. And that is the resting potential. So the way that that resting potential is established and maintained is by the following steps. It's maintained, first of all, by a sodium potassium pump. And that's shown here in purple. And this involves active transport and therefore ATP. The pump will move two potassium ions into the axon and three sodium ions out of the axon or the neuron. This creates an electrochemical gradient causing potassium ions to diffuse out and sodium ions to diffuse in. However, the reason that we end up with a more negative inside compared to outside is the membrane is more permeable to potassium ions. And there's a couple of reasons why. First of all, many of the potassium ion channels are permanently open, whereas the sodium ion channels aren't always open. And the second reason is there are more of these channels embedded in the membrane. 
So those reasons mean that more potassium ions are going to be pumped out. So you have a comparatively higher charge on the outside compared to inside. And that's how we get this minus 70 millivolts. Now an action potential is when the neuron's voltage increases beyond a set threshold. And that then results in the generation of a nervous impulse. An increase in the voltage is known as depolarization, and that is due to the neuron membrane becoming more permeable to sodium ions. And therefore, sodium ions will be entering the neuron, and that is what creates this more positive voltage until eventually it does get to the point where it is at the maximum level of plus 40. And once an action potential is generated, it moves along the axon like a Mexican wave. So essentially following this change in voltage at every position, or in this case, at every node of Ramvir, along the axon. We're gonna go through then all of these stages of the graph. So this change over time at one position in the axon and what causes these changes in voltage. So until there is a stimulus, we are at our resting potential. And then at this point, we can see there is a stimulus. And a stimulus provides energy that can cause the voltage-gated ion channels, the sodium ion channels, in the axon membrane to open. And that will cause sodium ions to diffuse in, which increases the positivity of the axon. So here we have what is happening at resting potential. But then when we have that stimulus causing the sodium ion channels to open, we can see that is now open and we will get more sodium ions diffusing in. This causes even more voltage-gated channels to open, so even more sodium ions are going to diffuse in, and that's why the voltage becomes more positive. When a threshold of minus 55 millivolts is reached or exceeded, you will then always reach this maximum of plus 40 millivolts. And when you reach that point, voltage-gated sodium ion channels close, but the potassium ion channels stay permanently open. So that results in no longer having any more sodium ions diffusing in, but you still have potassium ions moving out. And that is why we get this repolarization occurring, which is when the voltage decreases again. We then have a potassium ion channel that opens at this point, so even more potassium ion channels leave. And this is how you get this overshoot where you get hyperpolarization, meaning that the voltage becomes even more negative than the resting potential. So we can see here it is now in what we call the refractory period. And during that period, you wouldn't be able to generate another action potential. So that is how one action potential is generated. And that would have happened just at this first position on the axon. But once an action potential is generated, that can then trigger the voltage-gated sodium ion channels at the next position on the axon to open, and you go through this whole action potential again. And it happens at all of those nodes of Ramvir, and we describe that as being like a Mexican wave. The all or nothing principle is linking to this idea of the threshold. So if depolarization does not exceed the minus 55 millivolt threshold, an action potential and an impulse are not produced. So nothing will actually happen. Any stimulus that does trigger depolarization to the threshold of minus 55 millivolts will always peak at the same maximum. So the bigger the stimulus, you don't get a higher voltage. Instead, it's the frequency of these action potentials occurring that will increase. And that's what we mean by the all or nothing principle. And it's really important as it makes sure that animals only respond to large enough stimuli rather than responding to every slight change in their environment, which would overwhelm your senses and actually then potentially put you at danger instead of protecting you against it. We saw the refractory period within that action potential. And after an action potential has been generated, the membrane enters that refractory period when it can't be stimulated again. And that's because those sodium channels are recovering and can't be opened. Now, this is important for three reasons. Number one, it ensures that discrete impulses are produced. An action potential cannot be generated immediately after another. And this makes sure that each is separate and you can respond to each one individually. It also ensures that action potentials travel in one direction. And this stops the action potential from spreading out in two directions, which would prevent a response from happening. 
And number three, it limits the number of impulse transmissions. And that's important to prevent an overreaction to a stimulus. So the action potentials are what travel along the axon of a neuron, but there are gaps between these neurons called synapses. And at this point, the action potential can't jump across and instead neurotransmitters have to diffuse across this gap, the synaptic cleft, to then generate a new action potential in the next neuron. So let's have a look at this whole process of how it happens. Here is our presynaptic neuron, and as an action potential arrives at the end of that neuron, which is known as the synaptic knob, depolarization of that synaptic knob causes calcium ion channels to open, and therefore calcium ions will diffuse into the synaptic knob. Now that influx of calcium ions causes these vesicles here, which contain neurotransmitter, to move towards the presynaptic membrane. They then fuse with the membrane, and that causes the release of the neurotransmitter into this gap, which is known as the synaptic cleft. Because the neurotransmitter is only released from the presynaptic neuron, we then have a really high concentration on this side of the synaptic cleft compared to the other. And that means the neurotransmitter diffuses across the synaptic cleft down its concentration gradient. And on this postsynaptic neuron, on the membrane, there are receptors that the neurotransmitter binds to because they are complementary in shape. When those neurotransmitters bind to the receptors, it causes sodium ion channels that are embedded in the postsynaptic neuron's membrane to open, and therefore sodium ions will diffuse into the postsynaptic membrane. If enough sodium ions diffuse in to go above that minus 55 millivolt threshold, then depolarization occurs and a new action potential is generated in the next neuron. Now that neurotransmitter doesn't remain permanently bound. And if it did, it'd be constantly generating a new action potential, even if there wasn't a stimulus. So for that reason, there are enzymes within the synaptic cleft that are able to break down the neurotransmitter causing it to be released, and the neurotransmitter then gets reabsorbed and recycled. So this is unidirectional. The neurotransmitter is only released from the presynaptic neuron, therefore it moves down its concentration gradient, and there are only receptors on the postsynaptic neuron. So that is what makes sure it's unidirectional. Now an example of this is a cholinergic synapse. It's exactly that process that we went through, but you just need to be aware of the fact that the neurotransmitter is called acetylcholine. And the enzyme that breaks down the acetylcholine after it's bound to the receptor is acetylcholine esterase. And that will hydrolyze the acetylcholine into choline and acetate. Those get reabsorbed and can be reused again. Now we did say that it's only going to generate an action potential in the postsynaptic neuron if you reach the minus 55 threshold. And to make sure that happens, summation is involved. And summation is this rapid buildup of neurotransmitter in the synapse to help generate that action potential. And there's two types, we have spatial and temporal. Spatial summation is when you have multiple different presynaptic neurons all converging at one postsynaptic neuron. And collectively, they'll release enough neurotransmitter to bind to enough receptors to generate an action potential in the postsynaptic neuron. Temporal summation is when you just have one presynaptic neuron next to one postsynaptic neuron. And the repeated stimulation of that presynaptic neuron will over time add up to enough neurotransmitter to exceed the threshold. Some synapses are inhibitory though. So an inhibitory synapse causes chloride ions to enter instead of the sodium ions. And it can also cause potassium ions to move out. This makes the membrane potential even more negative. So it can be at about minus 80 millivolts. So your postsynaptic neuron will go into hyperpolarization. And therefore it's really unlikely that an action potential would occur because you would need even more sodium ions to move in to reach that minus 55 millivolts. We next move on to hormonal communication. And for this, we need to look at the endocrine system. And this is made up of endocrine glands and it's responsible for the hormonal communication. Endocrine glands secrete hormones 
and those are then transported in the blood where they will then bind to receptors on the target cells of the target organs. And we can see here a selection of the different organs that make up the endocrine system. So a hormone is a chemical messenger transported in the blood. Hormones have widespread and longer lasting effects compared to the nervous system response. And hormones could be steroids, proteins, glycoproteins, polypeptides, amines, and tyrosine derivatives. Steroid hormones are lipid soluble and they can diffuse across the cell surface membrane into their target cell to bind to a receptor often located within the cytoplasm. So for example, estrogen. Non-steroid hormones are insoluble in lipids and therefore cannot diffuse across the cell surface membrane. Instead, they bind to complementary shaped receptors on the surface membrane of the target cell, for example, insulin. This binding to a receptor causes a cascade of responses within the cell, and that is how the hormone causes a response. So if we have a look at the adrenal glands as an example of an endocrine gland, humans have two, and they're located on the top of each kidney. Adrenal glands are made up of adrenal cortex and the adrenal medulla, and that is then surrounded by a capsule, which is the outer layer. The adrenal cortex and the adrenal medulla sections both secrete hormones. So let's have a look at these two sections. The adrenal cortex is controlled by hormones secreted by the pituitary gland located in the brain. There are three types of hormones that the adrenal cortex can secrete, which are these three just listed here. The adrenal medulla is controlled by the nervous system. When the sympathetic nervous system is stimulated, it causes the release of adrenaline, which can increase heart rate and raise blood glucose concentration, and noradrenaline, which increases heart rate, causes pupils to dilate, widens the airways in the lungs, and narrows the blood vessels in non-essential organs to create a higher blood pressure. Next, we have a look at the pancreas. So this is a gland located behind the stomach. It releases hormones to control blood glucose levels and enzymes for digestion, functioning as an exocrine gland. Most of the pancreas is made up of the exocrine tissue, secreting amylase, proteases, and lipases. There are small regions of endocrine glands amongst the exocrine tissue, and these are called the islets of Langerhans. The islets of Langerhans are made up of alpha cells and beta cells, and the alpha cells secrete glucagon, and the beta cells secrete insulin. And this takes us into the control of blood glucose concentration. The amount of glucose in your blood will increase after ingesting food containing carbohydrates or drinks containing carbohydrates, and it decreases following exercise or if you haven't eaten anything containing carbohydrates in a period of time. But to control the blood glucose concentration, the pancreas is one of the key organs. It detects changes in the blood glucose levels. The islets of Langerhans will then release insulin and glucagon to bring it back to its normal level. Insulin is released when glucose levels are too high in the blood and it causes a decrease in blood glucose levels. Glucagon, on the other hand, is released when blood glucose levels are too low and it causes an increase in blood glucose levels. Adrenaline is released by the adrenal glands when your body anticipates danger and this results in more glucose being released from the hydrolysis of glycogen in the liver. So if you have a look at this negative feedback response, your blood glucose levels would increase after eating a carbohydrate rich meal. This would be detected by the beta cells in the islets of Langerhang in the pancreas. The beta cells will then release insulin. We're gonna go through how insulin then causes changes, but essentially the shorthand is liver cells will then become more permeable to glucose and enzymes are activated to convert glucose to glycogen. That will then remove glucose from the blood and store it as glycogen in the liver cells. And as a result, your blood glucose levels decrease and go back within the normal limit. Now alternatively, maybe you've just done lots of exercise and the glucose has been used up for respiration, so your blood glucose levels have now decreased. This is detected by the alpha cells in the islets of Langerhans in your pancreas. Alpha cells will then release glucagon and the adrenal glands will release adrenaline. We'll have a look at what the second messenger model is shortly, but that will occur and activate enzymes to hydrolyze the glycogen within the liver cells back into glucose. That will then be released into the blood and increase your blood glucose levels back within the normal limit. So if we have a look at the control of insulin secretion, when there is a normal blood glucose concentration, 
the potassium ion channels within the cell membrane of the beta cells remain open, maintaining that minus 17 millivolt resting potential. If the blood glucose concentration increases, glucose enters the cell by a glucose transporter. That absorbed glucose is used in respiration to make ATP, which binds to the potassium ion channels. This causes them to close and no more potassium ions can diffuse out of the cell resulting in depolarization. The depolarization causes voltage-gated calcium ion channels to open, so calcium ions enter. And when the calcium ions enter, they cause secretory vesicles to move towards the cell membrane and release the insulin they contain by exocytosis. So the action of this released insulin then is the beta cells that are releasing it, and the insulin will cause a decrease in blood glucose levels in the three following ways. It will attach to receptors on the surface of target cells, which would be your liver cells. This changes the tertiary structure of the channel proteins embedded within the membrane, resulting in more glucose being absorbed by facilitated diffusion. More of those protein channels are also incorporated into the cell membrane so that more glucose is absorbed from the blood into the cells. And lastly, the binding of the insulin to the receptor activates enzymes involved in the conversion of glucose to glycogen. And this results in glycogenesis in the liver. So this here is just showing you part of that idea. We've got the insulin bound to the receptor on the cell surface membrane. The binding causes the vesicles which contain the glucose channel proteins to move towards the cell surface membrane. They will then fuse with the membrane and you then get more of these channel proteins embedding. Next, then we look at the action of glucagon. It's the alpha cells in the islets of Langerhang that detect when the blood glucose is too low and they'll secrete glucagon in response. So glucagon increases blood glucose in the following ways. First of all, it attaches to receptors on the surface of the target cells, which are typically the liver cells. When glucagon binds, it causes a protein to become activated into adenylate cyclase and it converts ATP into a molecule called cyclic AMP, or CAMP. CAMP activates another enzyme, protein kinase, and that can hydrolyze glycogen into glucose. So step two is the second messenger model, and it's how enzymes are activated to hydrolyze glycogen into glucose. Finally, glucagon can also activate enzymes involved in the conversion of glycerol, and amino acids into glucose. And that is known as our gluconeogenesis, meaning we're making glucose from something new, something that isn't a carbohydrate. So here is our second messenger model in more detail. We've got the glucagon binding to glucagon receptors on the cell surface membrane of the liver cell. Once it's bound, it causes a change to the shape of the enzyme adenylin cyclase or adenylate cyclase, and that activates it to change shape. That change in shape now means it's able to catalyze the reaction of ATP in cyclic AMP or CAMP. And CAMP is the second messenger in this model. Glucagon was the first messenger because it caused the first activation. Cyclic or cyclic AMP is going to cause the second activation. It's activating a protein kinase and that protein kinase is responsible for hydrolyzing glycogen into glucose. Now the role of adrenaline is very similar to glucagon. It's also released if there is too low a blood glucose concentration and the adrenaline will increase the blood glucose. First of all, it will attach to receptors on the surface of the target cell. And this causes the protein, the G protein, to be activated to convert ATP and cyclic AMP. Cyclic AMP activates the enzyme that can hydrolyze glycogen into glucose. And again, that is showing you the second messenger model. So both adrenaline and glucagon cause this second messenger model process. So in summary then, the roles of the liver, we have glycogenesis, and that's when we convert glucose into glycogen. And this incurs in the liver, and it's catalyzed by the enzymes there. Glycogenolysis is the hydrolysis of glycogen to glucose, and this occurs in the liver due to the second messenger model. Gluconeogenesis is the creation of glucose from other molecules 
such as the amino acids and the glycerol. Diabetes is the inability to control your blood glucose levels. And type 1 diabetes is when you're unable to produce insulin or you don't produce sufficient amounts. And this typically starts in childhood as a result of an autoimmune disease where the beta cells have been attacked and destroyed. And therefore, they're unable to produce sufficient amounts or any insulin. The treatment would therefore be injections of insulin. Type 2 diabetes is when the receptors on the target cells lose their responsiveness to insulin. And this usually develops in adults because of obesity and poor diet. It's controlled by regulating the intake of carbohydrates in your diet, increasing exercise and sometimes insulin injections as well. So this insulin that we're talking about being used in the treatment of diabetes is produced by genetically modified bacteria. But in the future, diabetes could potentially be treated by using stem cells. And this is focusing on type 1 diabetes, where the autoimmune disease has damaged the beta cells. So you could use stem cells to replace those faulty B cells which can't produce enough insulin. The stem cells would probably have to come from embryos, which comes with ethical concerns around the destruction of the embryos. However, if it was successful, patients wouldn't have to constantly inject insulin or wait for a potential pancreas donor. And the stem cells, if they were from a cloned embryo of themselves, would be unlikely to be rejected. Next, we move on to plant and animal responses. Now, plants can't run away from animals trying to eat them or move to the shade if they're too hot like animals can. Therefore, plants have evolved to have a range of different responses to herbivore versus abiotic stress. Plants can defend themselves against herbivores using physical and chemical defenses. Physical defenses could include thorns, stings, spikes, barbs, and fibrous inedible leaves. Chemical defenses include tannins, alkaloids, and terepenoids. Tannins are very bitter tasting chemical compounds. The bitter taste discourages animals from eating the plant and tannins are toxic to insects. Alkaloids are nitrogenous bitter tasting chemicals and alkaloids affect the metabolism of herbivores, resulting in death. Examples include nicotine, caffeine, cocaine and morphine. Terpenoids are essential oils that can be toxic to insects and fungi. Citronella is an example and that is going to repel insects. Pheromones are also one of the chemical defences and these are chemicals that are released and affect the behaviour of other members of that species. Animal social behaviour are affected by pheromones but plants use them to communicate about danger. Volatile organic compounds act like pheromones for plants. So some examples include trees can release these pheromones when they are being attacked by an insect. And the release of that pheromone can cause neighboring trees to produce callos to help protect them against the insect attack. Another type of response is the folding in response to touch. And the mimosa paduca is a rare example of a plant that can move to scare off predators. The leaves of this plant fold when they are touched and the movement can scare animals and brush insects off them. In contrast, if we have a look at the responses to abiotic stresses, abiotic stresses the plants are exposed to could include high winds, excess water, a lack of water, temperature changes, change in day length, and changes in salinity, which is the salt concentration. The responses that the plants have include leaf loss. So trees will lose their leaves in countries that have cold winters. When it gets cold and the daylight hours decrease, the rate of photosynthesis decreases. And at this point, it's more energy efficient for plants to lose their leaves. Day length sensitivity also occurs. Photoparedism is the term for plants being sensitive to a lack of light. Plants are sensitive to how long it's dark for. And when they detect the dark periods are shorter, when there is longer daylight hours, it will cause the leaves to bud and flowers will bloom after winter. Next, we look at abscission. And this is when light levels decrease in autumn and winter. Ethene switches off genes for enzymes that digest and weaken the cell at the abscission zone. So there's a separation layer in a leaf petiole. This can cause the leaf to separate from the plant, leaving a waterproof scar behind to protect the rest of the plant. 
Some plants also contain chemicals which act as a natural antifreeze. And this is what prevents the cytoplasm from freezing when it's really, really cold. There is also stomatal control. And this is when the stomata can open and close in response to different stimuli. The evaporation of water out of the stomata provides a cooling effect to the plant. And that opening and closing of the stomata can be controlled by the hormone ABA in response to temperature stress. Tropisms is another example of responses in plants. And in this way, the plants respond via growth in response to a stimulus. They can be positive or negative. Positive is when the plant would be growing towards the stimulus. Negative is when it grows away from the stimulus. And they tend to respond to light, gravity, and water stimuli. Tropisms are controlled by specific growth factors. And one key example is IAA. IAA is a type of auxin can control cell elongation shoots and inhibit the growth of cells in the roots. It's made in the tip of the roots and the tip of the shoots, but it can diffuse to the other cells. So if we have a look at phototropisms in the shoots, first of all, light is needed for the light dependent reactions in photosynthesis. So it's important that the plant is able to have as much exposure to sunlight as possible. So the plant will grow and bend towards the light, and this is positive phototropisms. The way that this happens is, in the shoot tip, IAA is produced. And in shoots, exposure to IAA causes cells to elongate and therefore plant growth. The IAA can diffuse to those other cells and cause the growth in the other cells as well. But if you have unilateral light, meaning from one direction rather than equally distributed, the IAA will diffuse to the shaded side. And that's what we can see here. When the sun is now, or the light source is on this side, it causes the IAA to diffuse to the shadier side. And that means the cells on that side will elongate more, grow more, and that's how we get this growing and bending towards the light source. The opposite is happening in roots. Roots do not photosynthesize, so they do not require light energy, but it is beneficial if they can grow down towards water sources and anchor deep in the soil. In roots, a high concentration of IAA inhibits cell elongation, causing root cells to elongate more on the lighter side, and so the root ends up bending away from the light. And this is negative phototropism. In gravitropism in the shoots, the IAA will diffuse from the upper side to the lower side of a shoot. If a plant is vertical, this causes the plant cells to elongate and the plant grows upwards. But if you were to put a plant on its side, like in this example, that means the IAA will diffuse to the lower side with gravity. And that means the cells on the lower side will elongate and your shoot bends and grows upwards. So this is negative gravitropism. In the roots, the IAA diffuses to the lower side of the root with gravity. But as we said, in the roots, IAA prevents or reduces that elongation. So that means the cells on the top where there was an IAA will elongate more. And that's why the root bends down. And that is your positive gravitropism. Plants also produce hormones. And the hormones control a range of responses in the plants, such as the ripening of fruit, germination of seeds, lengthening of stems, and when the leaves drop. And here are four examples of hormones in plants that you need to know about and their roles. So these would make really good flashcards. I recommend pause and turn those four hormones and what they do into flashcards. Now those hormones can also be used commercially. Ethene is used to control ripening. There is also rooting powder used to encourage the growth of new roots from plant cuttings and auxins are used in this rooting powder. The auxins have also been used as weed killers and to make seedless fruits. There is experimental evidence for the role of gibberellins as well. A seed starts to germinate when it absorbs water, activating the production of gibberellins. The gibberellins cause enzymes to be released that break down the food stores in the seed so that the embryo plant can use the food to respire and make ATP. Evidence suggests that gibberellins cause this to happen by switching on genes that code for amylases and proteases. Evidence also indicates that ABA has an antagonistic effect 
and that it is the levels of these two hormones that control when a seed germinates. So the evidence for this is that experiments have been conducted using mutant plant varieties which do not have the gene that codes for the gibberellins. The mutant plant seeds did not germinate, but when they were exposed to an external source of gibberellins, the seeds did germinate. Experiments using gibberellin biosynthesis inhibitors also showed that these plants were unable to make gibberellins and their seeds did not germinate. When these plants were given gibberellins, the seeds did then germinate. Next, we move on to animal responses, and that takes us to the mammalian nervous system, which is made up of the peripheral nervous system and the central nervous system. The peripheral nervous system includes the receptors, sensory and motor neurons, and the central nervous system is the coordination center, which includes the brain and the spinal cord. The nervous system can be categorized into the autonomic or the somatic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system works constantly and subconsciously. This includes activities such as digestion, which you have no conscious control over. The somatic nervous system is consciously controlled. This is voluntary and is when you decide to move, for example, when you choose to stand up. The human brain is made up of billions of neurons and it coordinates responses. The key structures that you need to know are the cerebrum, the cerebellum, the medulla oblongata, and the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland, which we came across those two earlier in this video. The cerebrum is the largest part of the brain, and it's the outer layer, sometimes known as the cerebral cortex. It's made up of many folds, and it splits into two hemispheres. The functions range from controlling conscious thoughts, language, intelligence, personality, and high-level functions and memory. The cerebellum, which is the part towards the back that looks like a mini cauliflower, is responsible for coordinating movement, muscles, and balance. The medulla oblongata is just above the spinal cord, and it's the center of control of unconscious activities, such as breathing and heart rate. The hypothalamus is the small part of the brain responsible for homeostasis, such as temperature, and water balance. The pituitary gland is a small lobe structure known as the master gland because it secretes many hormones to coordinate several responses, such as the estrous cycle and osmoregulation. A reflex is a type of animal response, and it's a rapid, automatic response to protect you from danger. In a reflex arc, there are only three neurons. You'd have a sensory neuron, a relay neuron, and a motor neuron. And because you've only got three, that means you'd only have two synapses. So what makes it rapid is the fact that there are only two synapses and the synapses slow down the speed because it involves the diffusion of the neurotransmitters. As there's no conscious decision involved, the response is also rapid and it prevents the brain being overloaded with situations to decide responses. Once the stimulus is detected by the receptor, an impulse is passed along the sensory neuron to a relay neuron. The relay neuron passes the impulse onto a motor neuron, which is connected to an effector. For example, if the stimulus is a hot object, the effect would be a muscle in your hand or your arm, and the response would be for the muscle to contract to move you away from that danger. Other examples include the knee-jerk reaction and blinking. Another response is the fight or flight response in animals. When animals are exposed to a potential threat to their survival, a series of automatic responses are triggered to prepare the organism to either fight to survive or run away from the danger. The autonomic nervous system detects the potential threat, sending an impulse to the hypothalamus. This results in more impulses being transmitted along the sympathetic nervous system and the adrenal cortical system. The effectors are the adrenal glands, which will release more adrenaline and noradrenaline. These release of hormones trigger the hypothalamus to stimulate the release of adrenocorticotropic hormones, or ACTH, from the pituitary gland. Now, the action of adrenaline we've actually come across already when we looked at the role of this in the blood glucose concentration. But we've got the roles summarized here again. The control of heart rate is another response that animals have. And the medulla oblongata in the brain controls the heart rate via the autonomic nervous system. There are two parts, a center linked to the sinoatrial node to increase the heart rate via the sympathetic nervous system, 
another that decreases the heart rate via the parasympathetic nervous system. And we can see here our heart connected to that medulla oblongata in the brain via this parasympathetic or sympathetic nervous system. The heart rate changes in response to pH and blood pressure. And these stimuli are detected by chemoreceptors if it's a change in pH and pressure or baroreceptors if it's a change in blood pressure. And these receptors are found in the aorta and the artery directly after that, which is the carotid artery. So if we have a look at the response to pH, the pH of the blood will decrease when there is a lot of respiration because carbon dioxide is produced or lactic acid and both of those would decrease the pH of the blood. Now that carbon dioxide and lactic acid have to be removed rapidly so they don't denature enzymes. And this is achieved by the response here, an increase in the heart rate. And that is because there'll be more impulses via the sympathetic nervous system to the SAN in the heart, which causes the heart rate to increase and therefore pump the blood more rapidly to the lungs where carbon dioxide can diffuse out at the alveoli. In response to pressure, if the blood pressure is too high, this can cause damage to the walls of the arteries and it's important to put mechanisms in place to reduce the blood pressure. This results in more impulses via the parasympathetic nervous system to decrease the heart rate. If the blood pressure is too low, there may be insufficient blood supply of that oxygenated blood to respiring cells or insufficient removal of waste. So this results in more impulses via the sympathetic nervous system to increase the heart rate. Next, we move on to looking at muscles. And there are three types of muscles. We have skeletal muscles, and most muscle is skeletal. And this is attached to the skeleton and is responsible for movement. Cardiac muscle is within the heart. It's myogenic, meaning it does not require input from the nervous system to contract and relax. Finally, there is involuntary or smooth muscle. This is the muscle that lines organs and blood vessels and by contracting and relaxing it causes movement of the contents of an organ or a blood vessel. A neuromuscular junction is where we have a neuron meeting the muscles which would be acting as your effector in the response arc. You might need to know differences between the neuromuscular junction and the cholinergic synapse. There are many, many similarities because you still have this same idea of the neurotransmitters being released, but some of the key differences are the neurotransmitter is binding to receptors on the muscle fibers rather than on the postsynaptic neuron. The other differences are written out here, and this would make quite a good flashcard to summarize these differences between your neuromuscular junction and your cholinergic synapse. Focusing on the skeletal muscles then, Muscles act in antagonistic pairs against an incompressible skeleton, and that's what creates movement. This could be automatic as part of a reflex response, or it could be controlled by conscious thought. My fibrils are made up of a few cells that share a nuclei and cytoplasm, which is known as the sarcoplasm, and there are a high number of mitochondria. These myofibrils are made up of sarcomeres, and we can see here one section, the sarcomere, in a myofibril and a sarcomere is made up of the proteins actin and myosin. The muscle fibers are made up of millions of myofibrils, and those collectively bring about the force to cause movement. Those myofibrils are made up of two key proteins, the myosin and actin, and that is what forms the sarcomere. So this here is showing you the actin and the myosin within your sarcomere, and they are layered on top of each other in these different bands. And you could be asked to talk about what happens to the width of the bands when a muscle contracts. Your A band is the length of the myosin. Your H zone is where you have just myosin with no actin overlapping it. The I band is where you have just actin with no myosin overlapping it. The Z line is the barrier or the end of one of the sarcomeres. So when your muscles contract, we'll look at the sliding filament theory in the next slide, but essentially you are sliding these fibers closer together. So that means that your A band will always remain constant because the myosin isn't getting any thicker or thinner. It's simply sliding the actin closer together. So the A band remains constant, but the H zone decreases inside 
because the axin is now moving closer together. That also means that the I band has decreased and our Z lines are now closer together. And this here is showing you that under a microscope and you can see that those Z lines have become closer together. So what is actually causing this to happen is explained by the sliding filament theory. When an action potential reaches the muscle, which is the effector, it stimulates a response. Calcium ions enter and cause the protein tropomyosin to move and uncover the binding sites on actin. So we can see here this tropomyosin shown in yellow and it is blocking some of those binding sites. But when calcium ions enter, it moves the tropomyosin out of the way, so all of these binding sites are now revealed. On the myosin, we've got these structures called the myosin heads, and ADP and PI are attached to it. And whilst ADP is attached to the myosin head, the myosin heads bind to the actin to form this cross bridge structure. That binding creates this angle and tension, and as a result, the actin filament is pulled and slides along the myosin. And in doing so, the ADP molecule is released. An ATP molecule then binds to the myosin head, and that causes it to change shape and detach from the actin. Within the sarcoplasm, there is an enzyme ATPase, which is activated by the calcium ions to hydrolyze that ATP back into ADP and PI. And that releases enough energy for the myosin head to return to its original position. This entire process continually repeats, sliding the actin closer and closer together, which is your muscle contracting. And that will continue to happen as long as calcium ions are being released by the sarcoplasm, which means that the tropomyosin is being moved out the way. The role of ATP and phosphocreatine in this are important also. Active muscles need a high concentration of ATP, and that is because of their role in the sliding filament theory. The chemical phosphocreatine, which is stored in muscles, assists this by providing the phosphate to regenerate ATP from ADP. We next move on to photosynthesis, and we start by looking at the structure of a chloroplast. So your chloroplast is a double membrane bound organelle. And within that, we then have these thylakoid membranes that are highly folded and form these stacks called a granum or grana for plural. And those thylakoid membranes have lots of photosynthetic proteins such as chlorophyll embedded within them and also electron carrier proteins, which are used in the light dependent reactions. There's also the stroma, which is the fluid center, which contains the enzymes involved in the light independent reactions. The inner and outer membranes, just like other plasma membranes control what can enter and leave the organelle. So looking at chlorophyll in a bit more detail, chlorophyll is located in the photosystems on the thylakoid membrane. And those are the proteins embedded within the membrane. And chlorophyll is a mix of different proteins that can absorb a range of wavelengths of light. There are five key closely related types of pigments, but chlorophyll A is the most abundant. Below are the other types that you need to know about. So chlorophyll A, which is bluey green and in all plants, but there's also chlorophyll B, carotenoids, xanthophylls, and phaophytins. The reason that it's an advantage to have a range of pigments is they each absorb a slightly different wavelength of visible light. And this maximizes the spectrum of visible light that gets absorbed, and therefore overall it increases the amount of light energy absorbed. And that is what this graph over here demonstrates. Here we've just got chlorophyll A and B represented, showing you the wavelengths of light that they absorb and which ones must be reflected because there is a low absorption rate. So that means all of this visible light has been reflected and wasted by having multiple additional pigments that would increase the wavelengths of light that are absorbed. So out of those five that we just looked at, chlorophyll B, xanthophylls, phaophytins, and carotenoids are all embedded within the thylakoid membrane and form a light harvesting system. The light harvesting system is where light energy of different wavelengths is absorbed, and this energy is then transferred to the reaction center. The reaction center contains chlorophyll A and is where light-dependent reactions occur. 
the light harvesting system and reaction center make up a photosystem. So now let's have a look at the actual reactions, starting with the light dependent stage. This is the first stage of photosynthesis and involves harvesting energy from light. The purpose of this stage is to harvest that light energy, use it to split water, and then it's resulting in the creation of ATP and reduced NADP. And those two molecules are needed in the light independent reactions. So the light dependent stage happens on the thylakoid membrane and it involves four key steps, non-cyclic photophosphorylation, cyclic photophosphorylation, photolysis or photolysis, and chemiosmosis. So non-cyclic photophosphorylation, this involves the two photosystems, photosystem one and photosystem two. Photosystem two is the first of the two photosystems to be used. Here you'll have pigments which will absorb the light with a wavelength of 700 nanometers. Photosystem one is then used and it has pigments that can absorb light with a wavelength of 680 nanometers. So that energy, that light energy that is absorbed, causes electrons from within the reaction centers to be excited and released. So this light energy that is absorbed in that photosystem two, it will then cause electrons from the chlorophyll to be excited and released. They'll be released from photosystem two. You'll also have some being released from photosystem one. And those electrons then move along the proteins embedded within the thylakoid membrane. And that is your electron transport chain. As those electrons move along, it results in energy being released. And that's going to link to what we're talking about in chemiosmosis in a couple of slides time. But ultimately, it results in the production of ATP. The electrons lost from photosystem two are replaced by electrons from photolysis, which is coming up in the next couple of slides. And the electrons lost from photosystem one are replaced by the electrons that are moving along the transport chain from photosystem two. At the very end of the electron transport chain, which we can see here, those electrons are picked up along with protons by NADP to form reduced NADP or NADPH. That reduced NADP and ATP made in this process are then needed in the light independent reactions. Cyclic photophosphorylation in contrast, some of those electrons that are released from photosystem one are not picked up by NADP and instead are recycled back to photosystem one. The transport of electrons still results in ATP production though, because as those electrons are moving, they're still going to be releasing energy. And that is through chemiosmosis, which we'll be coming to very shortly. So in this way, cyclic photophosphorylation does result in the production of ATP, but not the production of reduced NADP. Now we mentioned photolysis of water, replacing the electrons lost from photosystem two. So photolysis or photolysis, literally means light splitting. So we've got light splitting water. And that's what happens. Light energy is absorbed and that energy will then split water into oxygen, electrons and protons. Those protons are picked up by the NADP to form NADPH. The electrons we just talked about are picked up by photosystem two to replace the ones that were lost in the electron carrier chain. And the oxygen isn't used, so that can be used in respiration or it'll just diffuse out of the stomata. Finally, then in the light dependent reactions, we have chemiosmosis. And here we can see the involvement of photosystem two and one again. So the electrons that are excited and released by the chlorophyll within photosystem two, we said move along the embedded proteins in that electron transport chain. As they move from protein to protein, they release some energy, and that energy is used to actively transport protons from the stroma into the space within the thylakoid, known as the thylakoid lumen. As a result, we end up with lots of protons within the thylakoid lumen compared to the stroma, and this creates an electrochemical gradient. Those protons then move down their electrochemical gradient through the only protein that they're complementary in shape to bind to, which is ATP synthase. And as they move through, that enables that enzyme to catalyze the phosphorylation of ADP and PI into ATP. So that is how we create ATP through our non-cyclic and cyclic phosphorylation in chemiosmosis. 
And then finally, that reduced NADP. At the end of that electron transport chain, the electrons and the protons that have returned are picked up by NADP to make our reduced NADP or NADPH. So next we move on to the light independent reactions. And this is also known as the Calvin cycle. Now this occurs in the stroma, which is the fluid center of the chloroplast, which contains the enzyme Rubisco, which catalyzes one of the key steps in this reaction. And because there's an enzyme, it's temperature sensitive. The Calvin cycle uses carbon dioxide and it's going to use the reduced NADP and ATP from the light dependent stages to form a hexose sugar. The ATP is going to be hydrolyzed to provide energy for these reactions and the reduced NADP donates the hydrogen to reduce GP into TP. So let's have a look at this in more detail. We start off by seeing how the Rubisco is involved and carbon dioxide enters the cycle by reacting with a five carbon compound represented by these five yellow circles and carbon dioxide and RUBP react together to form two molecules of GP catalyzed by Rubisco. So we now have six carbons in total, but it's split into two three carbon compounds. That GP is then reduced into two molecules of TP. But the reduction is where we see the use of reduced NADP. So hydrogen is released from the NADP, picked up by GP to reduce it. And this stage requires energy, and that's why ATP is needed at this point. Some of the carbon, in fact it's one carbon, is lost from those two TP molecules every cycle. And that goes towards making a hexose sugar, or useful organic substances. So that means you would need six turns of the Calvin cycle to make a hexose sugar. And each time when one carbon is removed, that means you have five carbons left, but we need to join them back together and regenerate the RUBP so the cycle can continue. And energy is required to regenerate that RUBP. So although glucose is the product from those hexose sugars, that is a monosaccharide and it can join to form disaccharides such as sucrose through condensation reactions or polysaccharides such as cellulose for the cell wall or even stored away as starch. It can also be converted into glycerol and therefore combine with fatty acids to make lipids or it can be used to convert into amino acids to make proteins. Now within photosynthesis there are limiting factors and a limiting factor is anything that reduces the rate of photosynthesis and that could be temperature, light intensity or carbon dioxide concentration. Temperature because it's an enzyme controlled reaction, light intensity because light is required for the light dependent stages and carbon dioxide because that is needed for the Calvin cycle or the light independent reactions. Now light intensity and carbon dioxide at high enough levels the rate plateaus because at that point there'd be something else limiting the rate of reaction. Whereas temperature because it's due to enzymes you'll get this increase in rates but then if it gets too hot, the enzymes denature and the rate would drop back down to zero or to a much lower rate. For maximum photosynthesis and therefore plant growth, common agricultural practices incorporate techniques to remove limiting factors. And that could range from using artificial lighting to maximize the light intensity or heating or even burning fuels to get more carbon dioxide. But the extent to which each technique is used needs to be considered in terms of profit. Because if the extra growth from paying for all of these conditions does not exceed the cost, then it's not cost effective. Finally, we move on to respiration. And in aerobic respiration, there are four key steps. Glycolysis, which happens in the cytoplasm of the cell. Link reaction, which happens in the mitochondrial matrix. The Krebs cycle, which happens in the mitochondrial matrix. And oxidative phosphorylation, which happens on the inner membrane of the mitochondria, which is also known as the Christi. So the mitochondria is also a double membrane bound organelle, but the inner membrane is what folds in this organelle to create that large surface area with lots of proteins embedded in it for this final stage, oxidative phosphorylation. We're gonna start though with glycolysis, and this happens in both aerobic and anaerobic respiration in the cytoplasm. And glycolysis involves three key steps. Phosphorylating glucose, the glucose phosphate using ATP, 
the production of triose phosphate and oxidation of triose phosphate to produce pyruvate with a net gain of ATP and reduced NAD. So this here is just demonstrating those different things we just bullet pointed. We start with our glucose, a six carbon compound, and then we are phosphorylating to create glucose phosphate or hexose phosphate. So we've used two ATP molecules, hydrolyzed them both to release the phosphate group, and that then binds to the glucose, so it's phosphorylated, and that makes that glucose molecule gain energy and become more reactive. And for that reason, it then splits into two molecules of triose phosphate. That triose phosphate then undergoes oxidation, and we can tell it's oxidation because we have the coenzyme NAD picking up a hydrogen from the triose phosphate. And the fact that hydrogen has been lost from the triose phosphate means it's oxidized, and the NAD has picked up that hydrogen, so it is reduced. And that happens on both of the triose phosphate molecules. And that's why two molecules of NADH are made. And this stage also produces ATP. And each of these oxidation reactions will create two ATP, so that's four ATP in total. The final carbon compound that is made is pyruvate, a three carbon compound, and we have two of those. So in summary, from one glucose molecule, we've made two pyruvate molecules, we have two NADH, and we have a net gain of two ATP. So although four were made, two were used. The pyruvate and the reduced NAD that were created in glycolysis are both then actively transported into the mitochondria and used in later stages. In the link reaction, that pyruvate is oxidized further into acetate, and NAD will pick up the hydrogen that is released when pyruvate is oxidized to make another molecule of reduced NAD, or NADH. There is also decarboxylation, which means the removal of a carbon molecule, and that's how we get carbon dioxide. So acetate, which is formed, is a two carbon compound. That acetate combines with the coenzyme A and produces acetyl coenzyme A. And this has to happen so that the coenzyme is able to assist in allowing the acetate to enter the next stage, which is the Krebs cycle. So from one molecule of glucose in the link reaction, we would get two acetyl CoA, two carbon dioxides, and two reduced NAD. And that's because for one glucose molecule, we got two pyruvates being made, so the link reaction would happen twice. Then we get to the Krebs cycle, and we can see here how the link reaction is leading into the Krebs cycle. We've got the acetyl coenzyme A, and that is going to combine with four carbon molecule known as oxaloacetate. And when those two combine, we then get a six carbon compound, which is citrate. And once we form citrate, the coenzyme A is released, and that can be reused again in the link reaction. There is then a series of redox reactions that occur, which generates these reduced coenzymes and ATP through substrate level phosphorylation, and also this carbon dioxide that is lost. So we'd have two lots of carbon being released to make two carbon dioxide molecules. We have one ATP being formed. We have three reduced NAD being produced, and one reduced FAD coenzyme being produced. So that is our series of reactions that are happening in this stage. There are actually quite a lot of intermediates. So for example, you would have a five carbon compound and then another carbon dioxide would be released and then you get the four carbon compound, but you don't actually need to know all of the intermediates in this stage, rather all of the products that are coming out of the cycle. So in one cycle, we create three reduced NAD, one reduced FAD, one ATP, and two carbon dioxides. But per glucose molecule, because there'd be two pyruvates, there'd be two acetyl-CoA, and therefore the cycle happens twice, all of those are multiplied by two. So in total from these first three stages, we have 10 reduced NAD and two reduced FAD. And these coenzymes are now all going to be used in the final step, which is oxidative phosphorylation. And this is the step where most ATP is made. Now, this stage is chemiosmosis. So it's almost identical to what we just went through in photosynthesis. It involves an electron transfer chain. 
the movement of proteins across an inner mitochondrial membrane and it's catalyzed by the enzyme ATP synthase. So your reduced coenzymes that were all produced and are in the mitochondrial matrix, dehydrogenation happens, meaning the hydrogen is removed, and that hydrogen is then split into electrons and protons. The electrons are picked up by proteins embedded in that inner mitochondrial membrane, passed along the electron transfer chain, that releases the energy to actively transport the protons, to create an electrochemical gradient, they then move down their electrochemical gradient through ATP synthase, and that enables ATP synthase to catalyze the phosphorylation of ADP into ATP. So that's how we make ATP, and because there were so many reduced coenzymes, we get lots of hydrogen ions and therefore lots of ATP. Lastly, at the end of that electron transport chain, those electrons have to be collected so that that chain can continue, and that is the role of oxygen. Oxygen is the final electron acceptor. It picks up the electrons and some of the protons that are within the matrix to form water. Next, then we look at anaerobic respiration. And this is respiration in the absence of oxygen. And it occurs in the cytoplasm of the cell only. The pyruvate is produced in glycolysis in exactly the same way that we just went through. But instead of it being oxidized in the mitochondrial matrix into acetates, it stays in the cytoplasm and it gets reduced to form ethanol and carbon dioxide in plants and microbes or lactate in animals. And it does this by gaining the hydrogen from the reduced NAD that was created in glycolysis. That then reoxidizes NAD so it can be reused in glycolysis to make sure more ATP is continued to be produced. So this here is just demonstrating that. We've got glycolysis occurring and then that pyruvate is reduced to form lactate using one of these reduced NAD. And that then removes the hydrogen because the pyruvate's picked it up and that NAD can be recycled and reused. So although we're producing lactate, which is lactic acid when it's dissolved, which is toxic and causes harm, that still has to happen so that glycolysis can continue to happen to make at least some ATP. And if this was in plants or microbes, exactly the same idea. You are actually making a harmful substance, ethanol, but that is necessary to regenerate the NAD by reoxidizing it so that glycolysis can continue so at least some ATP is made. And then when there is enough oxygen again, that ethanol in plants and microbes and that lactate in animals gets broken down in the liver into non-harmful substances, which can then re-enter aerobic respiration. And that takes us to the end of module five. I hope you found it helpful. If you did, then make sure that you subscribe so you don't miss out on any of my latest videos.